Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the start of a new campaign in you know the Last Days of Europe, in which I'm your host, Mr. Japanese Empire Level. But right now, if you'd like to read about the Dai Nippon Taikoku, please go right ahead as I slowly scroll down. But right now, we're led by a certain Ino Hiroya, and for this campaign, of course, we're using the most updated version of Tino, the town that's recording, Toolbox Siri, in which we'll see if Japan is fully not bugged anymore, as well as we can do well, but Eno nicks in negotiation. Uh, so the scene is a nondescript office in the Kantai. It is four in the morning, ha, and everyone is asleep except for the Prime Minister Hiroya, Eno, and Japanese provi Provincial Ambassador to the U.S., Tanzan Ishibashi. The two men have been in the office for 72 hours as of present, following the emergency radar contacts detected off Hawaii three days ago. Families all across Japan and the U.S. are glued to their seats. Those who aren't already in their nuclear bunkers and hideouts, it was deemed so until the telephone rang. It could only mean, of course, one thing. The first ring echoes, then the second, and in silence, the heartbeats of both men are clearly audible. The third, follow the, the protocol. Ishibashi, follow the protocol. The fourth, Ishibashi picks up the phone. Hello, Ambassador, it's President Richard Nixon on the line. We need to talk. At present. Two carrier groups are staring each other down 40 kilometers east of Oahu. One wrong move, one provoked nuclear reaction, it's the end of the world. Deep de beneath the waves of nuclear subs, the pinnacle of nuclear technology, able to end the entirety of Osaka or San Francisco in a single salvo, it's darkly humorous. How the fate of the world hangs in the balance through the actions of two men, one of which is on the verge of collapsing after a three-day run of unceasing work, in his stilted and weary English, Tanzan Ishibashi, so the words that would exchange a course of history forever. President Nixon, the Dai Nippon Daikoku, is willing to negotiate its position for the sake of our future and yours. We are spare for now, but we must begin. Actually, this already completed earlier, so this we would have we start off the campaign with this completed. If you'd like to read about the 62 fiscal report, please go right ahead. But <clears throat> financial analysis. How's our economy doing? Probably fine, but we can't rely on our subjective feelings for such important matters. We need cold hard numbers to base our decisions on, even if they just confirm what we already know. Economists, statisticians, and other experts will author a comprehensive report on the true economic situation of the empire. And this report shall serve as a basis for future policy. <clears throat> oh my gosh. A report to the Empire. Fortunately, the report, this report, was no easy task, but it was a necessary step to ensure our continued economic dominance in the Far East. Now that we finished it, it's time to revise it to the government and find a way to improve the economy even further. Our situation may be excellent, but we cannot afford to rest on our laurels and leave the initiative to our enemies, the light of the <clears throat> South. On paper, the sphere seems to be working like clockwork. Bringing prosperity to all Asians and their allies in the Pacific, and to bind them all together in a harmonic network glued by Japan, unlike the tyrannic shadow of the Einheit's pact and the hypocrisy of the OF, and the sphere stands to be to its true purpose. Development and growth under the Japanese benevolence, at least when they tow the Japanese line. <coughs> and yet they can't hold on to it. Minjiang burns under the darnable revolt of Tsendenbal. The Philippine Republic barely can hold back the communists descending from the north and the stranded Americans in the south. There's also the eternal problem of Malaya, the gravest threat of all of the UMAJF managed to reach Shonan To. Inon's telephone finally rings and he dutifully attends, turning away from the windows of this office that show the bustling activity from the street of Tokyo. We've all the cities, but the jungle's on fire. Thailand is not helping either. They can barely reach the border without getting harassed by their own guerrillas. Yamamoto's grave raspy voice came from the receiver and Ino took a moment to ponder the situation. Malay had long been a massive money sink and the repeated failures of the 25th Army constantly draining resources, as is with Yulo's Republic. Coupled with the rebellion of Mongolia, the cracks in the sphere had been endured to exist for too long. It's the time the opportunists remember why the rising sun shines brighter in the east, starting with the wayward light of the south. Secure Shonan To at all costs. Send aid and volunteers to the military government of Shonan Marai. Where was that one? Are we... These guys aren't fighting down here, right? It's Malaya that they're fighting, right? No? Who, who, is anyone fighting down here? Who's fighting? Is anyone fighting? Global complex. So look at that. But, you know, speech. The air was heavy with tension and crackling static. Across Japan. Uh... Uh, uh, across Japan's vast urban sprawls and Manchuria's great industrial centers, all the way to the Girin villages in southern China, over a hundred million radios and TVs crackled to life. In the houses of Guangdongs, large screens and loudspeakers buzzed as the crystalline notes of Kimigayo washed over all of the co-prosperity sphere. A calm voice announced in a dozen languages simultaneously that a speech from His Excellency the Prime Minister of Japan would replace regular programming for the day. Those fortunate enough to have a screen in front of them watched as the last notes of the imperial anthem faded away and the red and white logo of the co-prosperity sphere was replaced by the Prime Minister's office. Hiroya Ino, arguably one of the most powerful men in the whole world, sat behind a large and uncluttered desk in his order and suitably malignant office. The PM had a most uncharacteristic expression of relief, mouth curved in a small, dignified smile. Over a billion people held their breath as he began speaking in the measured tone befitting his office. People of Japan, honored allies, citizens and subjects of our great Asian family, I come to you bearing news of a great victory. Not the one we all are used to, one of marching soldiers and rolling tanks, but... 
No less great, a victory of peace. The Prime Minister pauses for a second as of yesterday. An unofficial agreement exists binding the co-prosperity sphere and the organization of free nations to the mutual respect of the marine boundaries and security interests. <clears throat> the specter of nuclear war that has hung over us all in the last few weeks is dispelled. The Prime Minister kept talking, but few listened after that. Roars of jubilation, silent thanks, and the myriad sounds of a billion souls returning to their normal rhythm, after weeks of panic and uncertainty, drowned out the Prime Minister's eloquium. El eloquium. For a brief moment, all of East Asia truly came together in celebration, and America with them as President Nixon made a speech mirroring his Japanese counterpart. Of course, not all were happy. Some had wished for a war, some had pushed for a war, some had for the notion of ascending Japan negotiating with the moribund U.S., ranked, rankled deeply. Doubtlessly, such feelings find an echo on the other side of the Pacific as well, but for now, peace has prevailed. Is this a true Tenonzan? Mongolian Civil War, which we do want to get involved with. Barat Mutiny, which is always great to see. And the Malayan Emergency. Alright, so they are having a little bit of issue down here. Here we go. You guys, and then you guys. So we need to send you volunteers. Um, I've never tried this. This is my first time trying it on screen, or just period, after, since Toolbox Theory came out. And I do not want to send trucks there, so, um, we're going to send the helicopter. You, and actually, ooh, what type of stuff do you use here? We use attack helicopters, which is nice, because I do want to use attack helicopters and transports, huh? I think I got rid of the transports by accident, so let's see, transport, let's go all the way to the bottom, maybe. Transports, or er, improved transports, there you go. My bad. There you go, nice. And go to five, we'll lower you by five, there you go. We'll get some attack helicopters too, and make sure that hopefully we can win here, because I've never done this before. Oh yeah, not bad. So let's take uno, dos. Led by, uh, Nishi. Yeah, we're going to send some planes too, so. Alright, so what do we have here? We can set up to 220 planes. Uh, I'll be honest, I completely got rid of the entire Air Force before we started playing this, so. Uh, 100 fighters there. And then, do we have any casts or tactical bombers? We got some casts, we'll take that. There you go, not bad. I guess almost done. Come on, come on, come on, come on. End of the missile crisis, very good. Across the ocean. Where are we? Are we here? It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. There you go. Across the ocean lies the greatest threat to Japan, sovereignty, and master of the Pacific, the U.S. of A. Humbled 17 years ago through our superior command of the oceans, the once indefatigable foe of Pan-Asianism lies slain and our mark on them, the treaty ports of San Fran and L.A., our daily reminders as such. The Kenpai Tai's branch on the west coast, W. Kekan, have inserted their proxies well into the confines of American society and have offered us an interesting insight into the attitudes of the Americans toward Japan. Richard Nixon, Republicans, Democratic Party, was an ideological and practical failure, but they still remain the voice of reason and moderation within American politics. Famously, Republican Democratic President Dwight D. Eisenhower broached the peace on the Pacific by illegitimately allowing Hawaii's ascension to the Union several years ago, as well as tearing up the Treaty of San Francisco. Though W. K. Khan has determined that the Republican Democratic establishment is the lesser of two evils, especially compared to the main electoral rivals, far more dangerous is the National Progressive Party. An unholy union of socialist agitators and their southern allies unite in the purpose of restoring American hegemony over the Pacific Ocean and risking war with the Japanese Empire. While relatively marginal in the terms of electoral presence, W. K. Khan has determined that the NPP could rise to em eminence over the next few years in a strong cause for concern as we would have to ensure our rival territory in Hawaii and the Eastern Pacific is secure. Two sides of the same coin. Ah, politicians. They don't give a rat's booty about you. Or me. We are nothing. Actually, can I send you volunteers up here too? Ming Jiang. No, we cannot. So they'll probably have to ask us for stuff. And that's not an easy group to play as too, but whatever. Why are we getting AirXP already? We're gonna need some more fuel. The Ulaanbaatar Rebellion. Beyond the home islands and more of our prized possessions in Asia, unrest has reared its head once more in the Mongol steppes. Our ally, Prince Demchub Dongrub, has already failed once to keep the Mongols in line in the 50s and now seems to fail again. While not yet completely or compelled, been compelled to become involved in the conflict, seems likely while once going to need to support the Prince's Japanese citizens' flee was friendly territory only weeks ago. Yet another uprising. Ming Zhang, how many guys can we send you this time? Wait, what? Uh. Are we not allowed to send stuff? Alright, whatever. Space race been won. Did you guys actually win there? I got a lot of divisions here, too. Yeah, y'all just hold. Ooh, if they, if they attack, I want us to make sure we get in on some of that action. 
How much manpower do they have? Half. Oh, that's a lot of manpower. How's their spirit looking? Not bad. Pretty good, actually. Pretty darn good. Some of our guys are getting shot down, but, you know, what else is new? Can you guys actually win here, maybe? I mean, maybe we could force the attack. Maybe, but... Let them continue getting attacked. It's fine for now. We'll see what happens. Let's get these guys move all around. Bait them into attacking us. Yeah, that's, is that bugged? Request Japanese support. Ulan Batar. Well, if they lose one, well, then I'll just kind of redo this and... Make sure they do okay. Maybe. We'll see. Borman's been named successor. Alright. Ooh, what do we have over here? I forgot to look at this. Conflict status. We have the Jones of the 25th Army. So we have this conflict. We have this conflict as well. Intervene. Hmm. Max volunteers plus one. Send equipment. That wouldn't be bad. Hmm. Send advisory battalions. Oh, get more attack. Yeah, why not? Our officer corps is rich in experience, having many previously served in the region during the Greater East Asian War. We'll send advisory battalions under the command of experienced officers to provide training and tactical support to our allies. Northwest China has always been a backwater, a death sentence for the careers of one's promising acquired retirement for the weary, and a containment ground for most of the rabid IJA officers and personnel. Well, this odd mix of comp competence and incompetence was sufficient for peacetime operations such as anti bandit raids as well as basic garrisoning. This should not suffice for an actual war, large scale rebellion. With the escalation of Tsen Dan Bao's rebellion, it would be wise for us to pour in more trained and effective assets in the North China Area Army. Specifically, Deploying motorized and airborne assets will be useful to us to intervene readily in the Mongolian steppes in case Prince D's government follows the Tsendenbal's forces in any case. We should ready forward cadres of these units and send them to Mengjiang as soon as possible. To act as forward operating units as well as advisors for the Mengjiang National Army. Hopefully this, with this deployment we can increase the fighting capabilities of the Prince's army. With luck, we can extend our influence far in the northwest against the Russian. The benevolent Japanese hand guides all. Better defense too, that's not bad. Send equipment? I'd like to, but I want to keep her PP. We might need to save it for later. And over here, authorized bomb swords against the UMJF. Well, that's defense is pretty nice, too. Ooh, they're actually taking us quite a bit. Or we could save her stuff. Raise war machine. Hmm. Maybe less attack. Authorized bombing swords? Why not? As long as we don't lose, that's all that matters. As long as they have no more equipment, too. That's what we matter. What matters, too, is Taro? Um. Do we have anything else? What else is that? Faction. Oh, crap. Faction relations, excellent. Conservatives, technocrats are terrible. I don't, I don't know which way the time is recording, uh, which way we're going to go, but we can guarantee the support of at least 226 MPs to vote for us on any bill. So I really don't know which way we're going to go for this campaign. So let me know in the comments below which way we should go. But yeah, next focus will be to show the public. The hard working Japanese people have always been the true reason for our unparalleled prosperity. It's only fair that they get to see the fruits of their labor. This will surely raise their morale to even higher levels. And it'll also dispel all unfound rumors about a so-called impending economic crisis. We have nothing to hide and the whole world will envy our continued success. Because right now, we have a slight surplus. Uh, we cut down spending on quite a bit except for the admin expenditure so we can tax more people. But everything else is really low. Sukiyaki. Suyo Sakamoto has almost overnight become one of the most recognizable figures in Japan. At least his voice has. His new song, U Ui O Muete Aroku, I Look Up As I Walk, now plays on all radios across the nation. And the gentle sadness, uh, oh, a whole system enraptured by the smooth timbre of his voice and the gentle sadness of his lyrics. It's a song of lost love, but not a mournful one, full of regret and hope in equal measure. The song's appeal has not been constrained by national borders. It was popularized across the sphere as part of his home, the home ministry's push to spread the contemporary Japanese culture among its allies. It became popular within the U.S. despite their government's hostility to Japanese exports of all kinds. In the Anglophone countries, the song was renamed Sukiyaki after the beef hot pot dish, an attempt to make this title shorter and more recognizably Japanese. The bright beauty of the song speaks to people from Tokyo to Washington, reminding them that despite the differences, they all know the pain of longing and the pale ache of lost love. Happiness lies beyond the clouds. An unusual request. Our Manchurian consulate has received a rare communique from Konstantin Rozhevsky, one of our old useful idiots from Mahabim. In his capacity as Valds of all the Russians, he demanded in rather bipolar language the return of Blagoveshensk, a region of far north of Manchukuo, which contains its hometown of the same name. The region is not particularly impressive in terms of its mineral wealth, and is full of ethnic Russians whom we have no reason to displace. The Manchurians expressed their profound indifference to the matter when it was brought to the government, so there's no need to bother getting them to a rubber stamp it. All of the authorities concerned have made clear that they don't care about a frozen stub of land full of Russians, and Rozhevsky is offering us rights to the resources in Far East and Siberia, once he, of course, secures the region. Though unlikely to happen, it would allow for some interesting investment opportunities, should he succeed so there's nothing to lose from seeding the lands in question. We may as well just send the request up the pipeline to the Diet and see what comes of it. We should hear back in a month or so. I never liked that place anyways. And just in case... Get more compliance, please. Thank you very much. Uh, here's what we're working with. We've got all these types of divisions here. 
You, you might actually be able to win. Oh, you guys don't go that way. Go here. Oh, yeah. Push in, boys. Also, we, I merged all the ships together. That's why we have no fuel right now, so. Meng Jiang requests support. Forward, friends, these forces of the Mongol United Autonomous Government have been battling the forces of the Yumagin Sendimbal's rebel government in the far steps of Mongolia. Mongolia, while well, backwater compared to the riches of Manchuria and China, still vital communications and logistics hub for transport through Beijing as such. Prince Di's forces should be aided by the forces of the North China Area Army as much as possible. Colonel Kodo Hara, representing our chief of staff, had come up with three proposals. A. The provision of air support from the 17th and 33rd fighter groups, as well as the bomber group of the Genzan Kokutai. The lowest possible commitment we can make, this would mean assuming significantly to the Prince's forces. Intelligence reports have stated that the air capacities of Sendenbal rebels are lacking. B, same as A, but with an additional provision of the 33rd Reserve Battalion as an advisor group for the Prince's forces on the ground. This would increase the land capabilities of the Xinjiang army, but might be seen as a waste of resources if the Prince loses the war in the steps. C, same as A, but with an added provision of the 2nd Armor Brigade, the heaviest commitment that we were able to make, this would increase the people, the Prince's chances of victory exponentially at the cost of massively lost political capital the Prince were to lose. Signed, Lieutenant General Ishihara Tadachi, GHQ out of Mongolia Observatory Group. Hmm... Officers and equipment. Provide training, expert, and armor brigade. All the stuff. Well, we don't want to lose here, so. Intervene. We should be able to send stuff anyways, but we could try that. Uh, infrastructure, less supply stuff, just. That's kind of cool. Patrols, more reconnaissance, unite you know, the princes. Huh. Can't fight to rearguard operations. Well, we try to intervene. Now we can only send one. No, no, we can send two. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of mountains here. There's a lot of desert. Some mountains around here. So let's send... These guys are 16 combo width, so that's not bad. We want to move fast. And not leave out one infantry. Maybe we'll send a tank division. This might be really bad to do, but whatever. All right. Good. How many guys can we send now? 40. That's not much. I don't expect much of an enemy air force. So, just to take bombers, cast. Okay, we got nothing here. There we go. Man, they move fast. Era Kurosawa Rises Sanjuro, one of Japan's most eminent filmmakers. Akira uh, Kurosawa has released his most recent opus, the uh, Jidai Kaki film titled Sanjiro. A sequel to Yojimbo, released the previous year, Sanjiro stars Kurosawa's frequent collaborator Toshiro Mifune and is based off Shugoro Yamamoto's short story Hibi Haian. Critics have appreciated the thematic shift from Yojimbo, as Sanjuro is now set in a fortress town instead of a far flung backwater, which many have panned for being too Western influenced. Rumors following the production of Yo Yojimbo include Kurosawa being threatened by the Toko and the figures close to the military, but there's not been any concrete proof of such, as by far and wide. Critics have lauded the film, with many praising the perfectly synergized mix of comedy, action, and adventure. On the technical end, many have also praised the cinematography of the film, revolutionary for the time, as well as Mifune's incredible performance. The film was also also Yojimbo in Japanese theaters, another milestone broken by Kurosawa. Rumor has it that Kurosawa has already begun production on his next film entitled Akahiga, while he's confirmed it as being inspired by another one of Shigeru Yamamoto's short stories. Rumors that he has considered Fyodor Dostoevsky work as another source of inspiration are so unfounded. Japanese culture is entering a golden age. Uh, can we look at 20? Ulan Batar? I guess it's only 20. Whoops, my bad. See you later. There you go. Alright, so what can we do with you guys? Not much. Do we have any other field marshals here? Yes. You might want to do something like that, maybe. And how are you guys doing down here? Still getting attacked, huh? Push fast and hard enough, you might actually be able to win here, maybe. Especially with enough air superiority. Not bad. Mm. Help him out here. You might just be able to push them hard enough. Uragio Brawl. Recent reports of rioting in villages on the outskirts of Urojiao have flocked in from the news agencies following disagreements between settler inhabitants of Outer Manchuria and the Russian agents. What began as a series of disputes over rights of land of the regions has since escalated by the outbursts of chaos that now ravaged small sections of the countryside and a handful of towns just north of the city. Police are reporting details of revenge killings against settler inhabitants, many of whom are Japanese citizens. Local garrisons have been requested by the Outer Manchurian authorities to help control and local 
Police Commissioner has put out a statement regarding the perpetrators as no better than the anarchists of the North. This comments follow the uncovering of a particularly brutal scene in which elderly veterans of the Greater East Asia War have been murdered in the streets. The recent violence and historic tensions between settlers and natives of Outer Manchuria can find its origins in issues of social and economic disparity, but local governments insist that disputes are the fault. A simple miscommunication gone wrong, however. Many are skeptical of these statements and defame them as methods to inoculate the Russians from blame in their own barbarism against the Japanese. Violence has always been their way. Air Raid Successful Lieutenant Asano swelled during the heat of the steppe, wiping his brow with his officer's cap. Mongolia was the last place he wanted to be assigned to. Little prospect for a career advancement in a perennial war against an enemy that faded into the sand dunes of the desert. Today, however, was a little different. His battalion was laying siege to a small town, severely held by Senden Bao's forces. Hey, Toru, when the... Who the heck's that air support coming in, huh? I'm effing dying out here. Send then Bull could effing shoot me himself if he wa- uh, Toru's stern stare shut the novice lieutenant up. While the ranks may not have shown it, Sergeant Toru Sajiro had been fighting in Mongolia for several months now and had seen it all. From the flayed prisoners left by the notorious 42nd Kwantung Battalion to Japanese and Mongols alike practically mummified in the desert huddled around a small bucket of water. Not gonna say anything, huh? Said the lieutenant as he picked up his rifle and tied his bandana around his forehead. Asano-san, shut the F up. The young officer didn't heed the veteran's warnings, climbing out of the trench. The pangs of the desert heat had gotten to him. The Mongol auxiliaries tried to get Asano to retreat to safety, but to no avail, at least. Until the fighter bombers swooped in low and knocked the delirious lieutenant flat on the sand. The last thing he saw before he passed out was a beautiful plume of orange, followed by an impressively black cloud. As the lieutenant drifted off, he could barely hear the screaming of Mongolian soldiers burning the distance. It almost feels like cheating. But we literally, just before started re-recording, we literally just won in Mengjiang. Which is great. The importance of Manchurian steel, though. Manchuria had been a prized possession of Japan for many decades now. The vast tons of steel located in the said northeastern region of China had become the cornerstone stock of the entire coast prosperity sphere. Iron will be mined from the earth in huge quantities and then brought to the cities in the south to be smelted and processed. From there, the steel would be shipped across the rest of the sphere. Day after day, week after week, the demand for Manchurian steel never ceased. In fact, it only seemed to grow more insistent. By the hour, steel was a pillar upon which nearly every part of modern existence was built. With Manchuria having no real competition in terms of steel production, it was vital to ensure that all was well with the economy there. Should it fall behind, then the precarious web of supply and demand could easily start to unravel. Local Manchurian government was required to make regular and particularly detailed reports in the financial situation of the steel industry. While the steel was still in Manchuria, it was kept closely guarded throughout the entire journey. It was not uncommon for the military to directly oversee the transportation of some shipments, even going so far as to station soldiers on board along with an occasional Navy warship. It became something of a common joke to claim that stealing the state secrets was easier than running off with a single steel bar. The time for another report soon approaches. And sure, continued prosperity. While their sphere is harmonious and prosperous, prosperous is not perfect. There are always rogue elements funded by the supremacist Germans and the imperialist Americans that seek to disrupt our unity, and weak men with little Yamato spirit who fail to contribute to the economic progress. We must rectify these wrongs, starting with the economy and how we guide it. Government stability goes up. Okay, cool. A quick war. And also, here's this stuff too. House of Representatives, 29 Ketoites, Reformists, Independents, Conservatives, and Technocrats. Oh. Look at that. Oh. Kaya. Yosu Ka uh, Yoku Sankai. Takagi. Kido. Government stability, 62%. As a measure of general confidence of and un unity within a government. Ensuring our faction maintains the plurality in the diet, secures the confidence of the House of Peers, and succeeds in passing its legislation, government stability will remain high. Should we lose the pillars of our support, or suffer multiple defeats in the diet, government stability will be damaged. Should it fall too low, we may begin to face growing pressure to step down and allow another faction attempt to form a government. Oh boy. Oh, public approval. Falling below 30% will rapidly diminish the ruling faction's power. Oh, that's not good. House of Peers. Falling below 50%, the Prime Minister's reign... Uh, falls in critical danger may collapse. A quick war. Or corresponds with Prime uh, or Prince Dem Chug Dongrub and reports from our own deployed pilots painting a rosy picture of the ongoing rebellion in Mongolia. Between modern air power, Mongol loyalists, and our own material support, the fate of the Mongol rebels is assured soon it will seem will be once more secure in the Mongol steppe and peace restored in Asia. As it should be, as we're still fighting down here too. As it, well, you know, they're attacking us like crazy, but you know what? I'm okay with that. We definitely need to get some more um, organization first before we strike out. But hey, we did really well here. Uh, meet with the generals. We get more command power, which is okay. Don't really need that, though. Supply anti imperialist forces. Eh, I think we'll be okay without that, too. It's not bad to do. More army XP gain. More daily command power gain. Mm, not bad. Send Japanese combat engineers. Sabotage or rumbles or machine. Honestly, with how we're doing right now, we don't really need to do that, I think. Me thinks we don't need to really do that. Faction stuff? Looking okay. Technocrats don't like us still, but still, whatever. Taiping is getting very close. The center of the sphere's workforce. China, with a large size and population, made for the perfect place for industrial and agricultural development. Although already the second largest economy in the sphere, the China's true economic potential is yet at untapped. 
For this reason, much is being invested by both Japan itself and the local Chinese government to modernize the extensive areas of land available for use. It was a popular goal indeed, as most Japanese and Chinese politicians wished to see it completely, completed as soon as possible. China had provided the absolute majority of workers for the entire sphere, providing Japan's power block with everything from weaponry to everyday electronics. These factories were owned by Japanese companies, using them to produce ubiquitous yet simple goods for maximum profit. The coastal cities had expanded greatly over the decades, but it was still the Gearing countryside that made up the largest part of the Chinese economy. Most of the sphere's food supply came from China, with most of the inland countries still being used for aiding this purpose. It was a manner in which farming had conducted that had changed somewhat. However, where rural communities had once sustained their way of life through farming, corporations now controlled vast areas of land, using it to cultivate their produce on the wildest possible scale. Entire villages could be employed by the same company, all working to produce the same foodstuff. Labor was kept cheap throughout the disposability of individual workers, who could be easily replaced by one of ten who were desperate for work. The ratio of the system meant that there was seemingly always room for expansion, always more opportunity to open more factories or to expand the farmlands. It was becoming increasingly common for most sphere-based companies to center their centers of production in China here. As the CEOs put it, they could operate freely and without the nuisance of regulation that they faced back home, indeed. They made use of China's difficult position to the very fullest. A difficult situation, indeed. Training the Mongolian Army. Hey, Toyo Da Kun. F and hot day out, isn't it? said the young Mongol as he entered the sergeant's hut. Or tent? Don't be so stupid, Altan. Don't you dare call me Kun. I'm still your superior for F's sake. All right, Toyoda-san, said Altan in still but clear enough Japanese. Sergeant Major Hajime Toyoda had been reassigned as an advisor to the Mongols platoon two months ago, part of their first observation regiments. They were deployed to Minjiang. His job was simple. Train the Mongols in accordance to the doctrines and traditions of the Imperial Japanese Army. Seems easy, he initially thought, until he actually had to train the soldiers. The Minjiang Army was a hodgepodge of auxiliaries, former bandits, and professional troops. Hardly any girl was able to understand Japanese, let alone conversing him. The language barrier, as well as extreme prejudice and contempt that the Japanese advisor held towards the Mongols had made unit integration near impossible, and Toyota's unit was no different. Look, Altan, don't get me wrong, I still think you're a useless crap, but you're slightly a cut above the rest, and slightly above is good enough for me. So what's the point of you calling me? Well, I'm putting you in for squad leader. I've seen you fight against those rebels, and trust me, I know a good soldier when I see one. Not afraid to take on a machine gun nest, not afraid to take on any prisoners. Sergeant Toyota walked out for a cigarette and patted Altan on his shoulder on the way out. In solitude, Altan wondered if fighting Mongol countrymen was worth it, but to him, as myopic as it might have seemed, joining the Japanese was his ticket up in life. The rising sun still lords above all. I mean, if you can win here, that's great. Get Taiping, and we'll have one. Defeat all them rebels, please. Thank you very much. As we're lagging to April 1st, not bad. Happy April Fool's Day. Ooh, the GDP actually went down. Look at that. Slight decrease. But this actually, oh, this actually went back up too. But we have a slight surplus, so inflation is going to go, oh boy, really high. We'll see what happens. So, did we get typing? Yes, we did. Very good. The Chinese economy continues to struggle. The Republic of China was due to send in their economic report, waiting for its revival. Prime Minister Eno considered the situation and the breadbasket of the sphere to better understand the documents he was soon going to read. China's current value was in its was in its ability to produce huge amounts of food that was needed in every part of the sphere. Despite this important purpose it, and its status as the second largest economy in the sphere's industrial expansion that was now the focus of both Nanjing and Tokyo. And tensions aside, industrialization had been going slow. Eno, like its predecessors, had insisted that the Chinese government focus their efforts on this purpose. As a dossier was placed on his desk, the Prime Minister hoped that his demanding tone had finally paid off. Eno's urgently rapid reading quickly made him realize that his methods were futile. As he had in previous years, he felt a mixture of anger and disappointment. China had failed him once again, industrialization was not in full swing with many, some very unimpressive movement towards that goal. The gearing sector of the economy had not changed radically either. The introduction of modern farming equipment and methods had done little to help ramp up production. Only some of the very largest farms have begun truly to modernize. Only they could handle that dramatic shift between the old and new in new way so far. The Prime Minister, having finished reading, was now focused on finding an appropriate response to send in Nanjing. We make our demands clear. Bengali Textiles Oh. Azad Hin has always been a useful contributor to the economy of the sphere. Although not as quite the same size as its rival government to the west, Bose had always attempted to make the most of his territory. Modernization has always been a key goal of his, and now the cities and farmlands of Free India exported much of their products and produce to the prosperity sphere's markets. Bengal, in particular, created many goods considered highly sought after, most notably the region's renowned textile work, ever since the days of the Roman Empire. These fine works of handicraft have been sought after across the world. British rule in India had only increased the worldwide demand for Bengali textiles. Manufacturing increased to new heights, as new machinery was brought in to increase the amount of textiles produced. Although now independent from British rule, not much has really changed in the ways of demands for textiles. The exportation of these goods was now a way to sustain the economy of an independent, if somewhat inconsistently recognized nation. Their popularity in Japan and the wider sphere ensured that demand for Bengali textiles never seemed to drop yet. The situation regarding the rest of the sphere's economy troubled many. Despite the efforts of Subhas Chandra Bose to increase industrialization, the overwhelmingly majority of land in Free India was still being used for its agriculture. The crops that were produced were needed for feeding the population and could therefore not contribute much to the economy. It was for this reason that the textile industry was so fiercely protected. Should the trend of agrarianism not be ended, 
the collapse of one industry could deal significant damage to Azad Hind for years to come. Now double your efforts and win in Malaya. Good job, guys. Maximizing growth. Ooh, construction speed. GDP growth goes up. Minimizing expenditures. Slightly decreasing. Mm. I want more growth. Oh, yeah. First, we must facilitate as much growth as possible for our economy by creating more and more construction projects and military contracts. We can further develop the islands while keeping the West at bay. While some spiritless economists claim that our growth will not last forever and investments should be made with a long term in mind, those are relevant. By letting our economic potential reach the heavens, we shall become unchallengeable. What could go wrong? Also, we're going. I always go down the left side here. The offensive strategy for strategic theorem is just never worth it. Plus two organization, you get blitz. Wow, that's not much. You get minus ten percent supply consumption, which is not bad, but you can always get logistic companies that reduce supply consumption, and more soft attack and hard attack and planning speed. It's not bad. That's actually pretty decent. But over here, you get for your army more defense, flat organization, flat entrenchment, more max planning, which is better than planning speed. For leg infantry, which makes up a large part of our military, more defense, more organization, more recruitable population factor, less minimum training level, and now the supply is okay, and supply grace is okay, but still. Not bad. Good job, Nishi. Take, takechi. Takaichi? Good job, soldier. All is well within the Free Indian Finance. Free Indians were the last of the nations to make their annual financial report. This was to be expected, as the reports came based on the relative proximity of the Sphere's center. You know, seated in his usual pet place, awaited his assistant to return with the report, which had just arrived in Japan around an hour ago. Eventually, he returned bearing an envelope, much of the same of all the other reports. Wasting no time, Eno used an ornate letter opener to extract the information sealed inside, like each in the series of reports. The letter began with a report on the economy of free India. The Prime Minister scanned the documents but quickly found that he had read enough to grasp the situation. Across three pages, the free Indian government had outlined their situation over the past year. Despite some difficulties, the economy is now doing particularly well, with no signs of declining in the near future. In fact, most graphs showed that more growth could be expected in virtually all major sectors. Agrarianism was beginning to come to an end with signs of major industrialization in the coming years. To Eno, this was a sign of triumph. Not only was a significant economy in the sphere doing well for itself, but it had occurred under his leadership. Azad Hind may have done the heavy lifting, but it was due to the presence or pressure of the Prime Minister that successes had been seen in the first place. Or so Eno seemed to think that it had occurred that way. Excellent, a fine year for free India. Now what do you have here, desert? How much? We have a lot of mountains here, which I'm thinking about sending more soldiers here. Yeah, we're not going to send tanks and trucks up here. There's absolutely no way. Peace conference is over. A sting of mere tolerance. For the first time in his life, Tukunda found himself disturbed, uneasy, shaken. He wasn't sure what he felt, but of course it wasn't good. When well, there had been a call for volunteers to help the Shinon enforce his expunged American puppet rebels in Malaya, he'd been among the first to answer that call. That there were those who were interfering with the unifying mission of the co-prosperity sphere sickened him. For too long, the peoples of Asia had been separate and turned against each other by Western foreigners. For the first time, thanks to the Empire and the wisdom of the Emperor, Asia was in the hands of the people. No foreigners, no imperialists, only people coming together for their own interests. How could anyone not want to be part of such unity? Of course, he'd heard of rebels, dissidents, and there, but they were nothing more than American and Nazi propaganda. So people would do anything for money and power, or so he thought. Stepping into the light of the South in person had been sobering. There was no more proud Malayan army waiting here. The collaborators were exhausted, fewer than expected, and undersupplied. It was quite clear why they needed help. Yet yeah, what was more disturbing was that he got an impression at some points that he wasn't he wasn't wanted, nor the collaborators for that matter. He didn't feel like he was helping his Asian brethren push back against the American imperialists. He felt like an interloper, an outsider. Someone who was tolerated and not welcome. The people did not seem to be on their side, and he did not know why. He couldn't blame this on the Americans, unless many in Shinonen too, to were secret spies. But why would they not welcome Japan's help with open arms? It bothered him, and he felt that this was going to bother him for long after. Long after he eventually returned home. Unwelcome helpers. Oh, nice. A long way to call. That was a normal day in Ino Hiroya's life. A relatively uneventful day, even, but who was he to complain? After all, in politics, no news and good news are generally one and the same. Yet it was quite an average day, he thought, at least until the phone rang. This is Ino Hiroya speaking, who is it? A prime minister, said an overjoyed voice at the other end. We've done it, it's over, we put down the UMAJF. Oh, wonderful news, answered the Prime Minister. Finally, the quagmire that was a Malayan civil war was coming to an end. After so long, the 25th army had at last done what it should have been done many years ago, and the radical insurrection was no more. But what was he going to do now? Thoughts rushed through Eno's head. Maybe it would be for the best to pour resources into Malaya as soon as possible to bring it back entirely into the sphere. But at the same time, it would be a massive drain of funds, and given the unstable situation at home, he wasn't sure he could really afford it. No, something else needed to be done. Something less heavy-handed. What then? So what should we do, Prime Minister? Yes, yes, my apologies. Listen, I want you to find out which high-ranking politician would be the most open to collaboration to us. When it's done, make sure they're the ones who gets in charge. And with that said, you know, hung up the phone. It was still a relatively uneventful day, he thought, at least compared to some. But with this news, it had just gotten a lot better. Good. What, we, do we need help here? Hmm. Hmm, sort of, not really. Um, 
With this, I'm just gonna keep paying off the debt for now. I mean, I want more growth, don't get me wrong, but we're gonna pay off more debt. Oh, right, look at this. Global complex. Ah, good job, guys. Good job. Ooh, more research, too. Great. Ah, things are looking up for Japan. As they should. Can I see any volunteers? God dang it, we cannot. Nomadic legacy, huh? Not bad. And also, we're building some, like, army factories, or army bases, prisons, hospitals, administrative, or schools. So, we're gonna build stuff a lot up, and we build a lot of roads. Not bad. We're getting more fuel. Also, I did say I didn't go do some ship stuff here, but I forgot about it. Look at all these carriers, man. All subbies. And we like those subbies because they're a little chubby. There you go. Uh, do we have a sea wolf here? Maybe not. Spotting. Oh, yeah, we have Tai Chi. Yes. There you go. Cool. Restore. Why not? And one, two, three. There we go. One, two. Good enough for me. And yes. Go and basically ruin all of our fuel supplies if we possibly can. And we have none. Yay. Now, Ming Jiang, hopefully we can help you out once again. They are a puppet of who? China? Oh, the Republic of China. Scouring the sea, sun and warm sea, sun and sea warm the Haraumi as a sail through the Sea of Japan in search of the creatures of the sea. For Captain Hata and his humble crew of ten, the day had provided good fortune. They were somewhere off the coast of Manchukuo, out of the way of the crowded seas from the competition. Here, the water was clear of others, and the Haraumi was free to fish wherever they pleased. The tuna and bonito kept coming, and they all knew they were done well. Sunset arrived, and the crates were packed with ice and fish, making preparations to sail back home. Captain Hata saw a shadow of a boat in the distance, with that what looked like a man holding a net. Holding binoculars to his eyes, he could easily see it. It was another fisherman, probably a Russian. His eyes slightly hurt. He was looking directly into the sun, after all. Compared to the relatively clean appearance of the fisherman, as well as the good shape the Hiromi was in, the Russian was poor. His ship was clearly falling apart. In spite of his best efforts, his facial expression was grim as he pulled out of his net from the ocean. Fortune was clearly not on his side. No shine of fish scales could be seen, as the fisherman himself was not in the best condition. Aged far beyond his years, and toughened far more than he should have been. Captain Hatsu could only watch on with pity, with powerless to do anything but to help. He hated to see it. We only need a casual 16,000 things of oil every day, even though we only get 2.8. Oh, when's miscellaneous bid income? What was that? Hey, it went down, but it's going slightly back up. It went down, it goes up, and now it's going back down. That's good. Only 260 billion in debt. I, is it possible for us to get rid of all of our debt? I, obviously, that's not. that might be okay, but still. Derigensime. If you know how to pronounce that, please let me know. But the doctrine of this literally means to direct in French. So it lives up to its name. While the ill-informed might mistake its embrace of the capitalist market for tolerance of laws of fair practices, Derigensime is anything but for the reins of a commercial and productive power lies firmly in the hands of the state. The enforcer, the burden bearer, and the sole overseer of the great economic clockwork. Nationwide projections, concrete planning, target investment, whatever vital matters not to be trusted with independent actors shall fall upon the shoulders of state institutions. Where the markets fail and falter, the state shall duly intervene, curbing inefficiencies and ensuring that national objectives shall remain viable and attainable for years to come. Despite heavy state involvement, however, private sectors remain just as crucial, if not doubly so. National champions, active or prospective part, pa uh, private patrons of the interests of the state, are to be prioritized above the rest. Other private industries are expected to thrive and prosper through self-incentivization, serving the state while heeding its guidance all the same. All shall align themselves towards the greater good and shall should not be exempt from it. Nice. If you want to know about that, because someone's going to ask me in the comments, what is their uh, thing there? Um, ooh, but bloody sun. Across the white marble floor of a Yasuda bank strutted an officer of the Imperial Japanese Army, dressed from boots to peak cap and a formal attire, wearing a face of dispassion underlined by the self righteous jingoism of a military man. A clerk operating a station at the counter of the bank looked up with two parts surprise and an unease at the sight of the officer approaching him. Upon reaching the clerk's station, the officer wasted no time on formality, saying, I would like to speak to the manager of this financial establishment. Sir, if it's all right, anything you would say to the manager, you can say to me. My job entails doing the task that the manager is otherwise too busy to perform on his own. If this is a matter of a loan, I could bring out the necessary papers, of course. This is a matter of the utmost importance, the officer stated through gritted teeth. I would like to discuss with the manager the matter of a loan to the Showa Shonen Shipping and Receiving Corporation. The loan has already been requested, but we are experiencing delays pertaining to incompetence on your end, and the original amount of money requested was denied in favor of a smaller amount. This behavior is unacceptable. The officer slowly leaned forward, putting his hands together on the counter, his gloves stretched, and his knuckles cracked. If I may inquire, officer, what does the army have to do with... You may not. I would like to meet with your manager immediately. I warn you, boy, you would not dare to show insubordination in front of a division of army soldiers, and so you should not show insubordination in front of me. 
The skull in the officer's face transformed into a look of hatred and insecurity. The clerk stared back in fear before clumsily opening the hatch to the counter so that the officer could enter. F follow me, sir. We still live in the wild. Meet with the investors. Ooh. Adjust the budget. Get more construction speed, though. Mm, money. Money now, money later. Uh, actually, let's do this one first. Oh, Meng Jiang can do well. Minimizing expenditures. In addition to keeping growth high, we must not forget to cut down on unnecessary costs. Infrastructure that needs frequent repairs creates more jobs and saves us money right now, after all. We should cut off unnecessary luxuries all across the empire, which your people will survive with a strong spirit. The Japanese of our empire need not worry too much, however, as much as our cuts will be in the benefits for the lazier of the sphere members who refuse to pull their weight despite their benevolence. Sasakawa wants funding. Kantai received a letter from the, from the famous philanthropist and innovative entrepreneur Sasakawa Ryuchi. He's establishing a new oil company based around the Karafuto fields and is wondering if Ino's government would be interested in subsidizing this enterprise. The prospecting operation was successful and a large and profitable fuel was found. Sasakawa believes that expanding oil extraction in the area would be a good way to make the Karafuto economy less dependent on agriculture and could potentially bring in a lot of educated workers. Long term, it could even revolve Toyohara into an important center in the empire's far north. Certainly a good idea, Ino is however unsure of the best is to handle the request within the Kantar or give it to the Kishi Nobosuke in Manchuria. He could possibly integrate it into the larger economic plans for the north. Kishi? I have no idea, man. Oh, no. Is this, is this important? This might not be important at all. Hmm. Mm, let's go to Kishi. I'm going to Kishi just because I don't know if Ino's going to stay here. Wink, wink, no judgment. But he's busy. Sasakawa presents an interesting proposition, however. I think it's best that someone with more experience, expertise in local matters handles this request for subsidies. Give me Kishi on the phone. No, so, Nobsuke Kishi, Prime Minister Manchukuo, was obviously the man to turn to at the Kante was not to handle the oil venture. Kishi spent much of the time in his domain developing it with brutal efficiency and brutal methods. Ino was sure that the possibility of Kishi being granted new oil wells for northern fiefdom would be more than enough to convince him that Sasakawa's offer was worth it. Kishi, I have a proposal from Sasakawa Richi to present to you. Kishi's reply was simply a mere go on. He wishes for aid in funding his efforts in extracting oil in the Karafuto prefecture. <clears throat> he claims it could seriously benefit the local economy, and eventually provides with a proper report to the far north. Inu could only hear the crackling static on the other end of the line, as Kishi seemed to consider the proposal in silence. Well, I'm afraid to say, Prime Minister, that the pro particular matters here in Manchukuo are far more pressing. It would be most unwise of me to turn my attention away at this time, although disappointed. Inu could do nothing more than to accept the answer he'd been given. The Jura authority aside, Nobosuke Kishi was not a man to force an issue with. With the first minister of <clears throat> Machukuo too busy, Ino would have to handle the matter himself, of course. While having more control over the oil wells was certainly beneficial, the prospect of negotiating funds with Sasakawa was the furthest thing from an enjoyable experience. Let us see what we can do now. Of course, we need that fuel right now really badly. Oh, you got encircled. God dang it, dude. But funding... Having decided to handle the matter of the new Karafuto oil fields himself, it was now time for Prime Minister Ino to determine the appropriate amount of funding to distribute. Sasakawa, although a member of the opposition of the Diet and a man embroiled in corruption of the highest order, was still a businessman that could not simply be ignored. His numerous enterprises and contributions to the war effort in the past decades had ensured that he would remain influential, whether the government wished it or not. Now that he had discovered oil, ever precious and essential to the function of the sphere, Sasakawa and the full had the full attention of the Kantai. Subsidizing his oil fields would be no cheap matter, of course, as was the case with anything involving oil extraction. There were risks to consider as well. A caution suggested that only a small sum should be given to Sasakawa. Lest his venture failed spectacularly, yet other voices suggested that Sasakawa's business in Karafuto was more than sound enough to deserve a generous investment. The rewards would surely be great if all went well as, as Sasakawa was describing it to be. Having heard both sides being put forward, Prime Minister Ino would now have this final say. A little bit over the required, this deserves more funding than usual. We'll probably go with that one, because we can. Very nice. But what about growth? How's the economy doing? It's going down. More money for Sasakawa. Having successfully constructed and operated one oil well in Karafuto, the question of whether or not Sasakawa could re should receive more funding has arisen. The well had been a success, extracting a profitable tonnage of oil a month, with no shortage in sight for quite a while. The idea of a second or even third well seemed like the best way to move forward with the operation, after all. If one well was producing at an, at an exceptional rate, surely two more would only pay for themselves, right? 
Sosakawa could obviously afford to cover the cost of construction employing more workers. Regardless of if he actually asked for it or not, the businessman would still be asking for more subsidization. Once again, the Prime Minister Ino would make the decision as to how much Sosakawa would be receiving. A great deal of money had already been invested in oil wells. Kashin spoke of providing a reduced sum enough to provide Sosakawa with some motivation, yet, with all the success of the business that had been seen so far, other voices suggested that even more money should be poured into the oil wells to truly access the full potential of Karafuta's oil reserves. Eventually, Ino decided to invest. No need to go overboard, my friends. No need. Debt to GDP ratio 1.103.6%. But we have unlimited debt ceiling, so. But still. Surplus. Not bad. More growth. Will be nice. But oh well. Murder in the Metropolis. The detective got the call late last night about a murder by the docks. It could have been the usual a deal gone bad over some insurance and poppy, some chunkoto killed for black blood. He'd seen the likes, but this was different. The port read like a guy for the perfect murder. No prints, no discernible weapon, no signs of forced entry, just the corpse mixed in with two tons of tuna. Finally arrived at a warehouse and crawled underneath the police lines. Whoever did this had a strong stomach, cutting his face up like that, he mused. Unrecognizable. The detective leaned down next to him, getting a closer look at his face, teeth pulled, fingers taken, and a big chino chinmoku carved a chest into his chest. Who, who the heck are you? <clears throat> hmm. Well, well, since we're there, we're gonna search the body first, since that's immediately in our face, quite literally. Uh, search the body. Of course, for all the evidence that could possibly be collected, the body remained in the center of it all. It was a grim reminder of the caliber of the crime and of the criminal that carried it out. Just from the first glance, one could tell it was not a, a hot blood of murder of the passion of rage, but a merciless case of cold cruelty. The first task had to be remove the body from the vat of now spoiled fish she was found in. The act itself had not posed much of a challenge, but the aftermath did. The forensic specialist had to sp carefully separate the oily pieces of fish carcass from the grisly gore of the victim, centimeter by centimeter, taking care not to erase any potential evidence. Slowly but surely, as the fish was stripped away, more Titos emerged from the ravaged corpse. Most notably, there did not appear to be any many signs of resistance on the part of the victim, despite the horrifying nature of the injuries. There were no abrasions to the knuckles to indicate a struggle, nor were there any of the wrists to suggest the victim had struggled against some restraint. In fact, there was hardly any blows from the blunt objects anywhere in the body, which likely would have required an order to subdue the victim while with more precise and painful aspects of the crime were carried out. The absences suggested something on their own, however. The victim had likely been killed in the first few stabs, with the last of the damage being applied post-mortem. Then these were not likely to be acts of torture, but intimidation. But who is being intimidated? The People's Revolutionary Council, that's who. As I keep coming back to the economy, look at it. Fortunate foresight. How about the, bo the wolves to cry, boy? Scan a politician undermine the emperor. Yukio Akiyama slipped out of the door just outside the national diet, wearing a brown long coat and deep uh, shady glasses. He held his fedora as he skipped down the steps, ushering himself out of the view of the crowds of press. Yelling and commotion beat him out as the cameras clicked and flashed. The rush of questions and accusations filled the thick air with embarrassment and flushes of confusion. Akiyama coughed up scattered replies and broken insults towards the tumbling masses of reporters, blinded by the flashes of more cameras, unable to get a word in amidst the allegations tossed in his face of rival politicians in the diet. A microphone was hurled at his face, prompting him to answer for his crimes. Akiyama cleared his throat and explained his cr criticism of extrajudicial killings in northwestern China by the military, even detailing his report or support for the same legal system in which the emperor was a sovereign of. Before he could finish his statement, the reporters hissed back at him and scoffing with more extreme accusations of treason. Aki almost faced colored further in frustration as he rushed through the crowd of reporters slandering his every step. Images of his face circulated in the press the next day, branding him as a traitor and opportunist, followed by the news of his resignation. His words to condemn military operations in China were shortened and trimmed to fit the articles, most branding him as a threat to the empire. The news, although alarming, quickly siphoned him out of the political affairs, and discussion of the violent happenings were not to occur. Again, who cares for the truth? Fortunate foresight. Eventually, the forensic experts were finished with documenting the crime scene and turned to move the body from his fishy resting place. At the request of the detective, the body was to be taken directly to the morgue where he would oversee the autopsy personally. Three officers with thick latex gloves and face masks carefully lifted the corpse out of the vat and onto the stretcher, but as they laid the deceased man down on the platform, one happened to notice something peculiar. Something appeared to roll around inside the man's abdomen, causing a strange bulge right next to one of the largest wounds. Warning if some fish had found his way into the body's chest cavity, the officer pulled open the wound to get a better look inside. But it was not a condensed ball of tuna, rather it was a military-issue hand grenade, entangled in a mess of wires leading deep into the crevices of the corpse. Fortunately, after the initial shock, the officer had the good sense to scream for everyone to get out of the building to call the bomb squad. Forty-five minutes later, the bomb squad re-emerged from the plant and confirmed they were safe to go in, thanking the forensic experts who volunteered to assist them. Unfortunately, the bomb squad had been much more concerned with defusing the explosive than they had were with preserving the integrity of the evidence on the body, but all that soon became irrelevant when the detective began looking over the components that, are moved, that were removed from the corpse and found a fingerprint right beneath the ring of the grenade. Well, that almost blew up in our faces, as pirate is getting better here, and research facility is getting worse, but oh well. 
Oh, 40%. Not bad. Oh, 62.4. How do we get any higher here? Oh, we get interactions. Oh, crap. I forgot about the system here. It's currently dominating the military for the Japanese Navy. Oh. Paranoia, huh? The higher paranoia becomes, the less more infighting the military suffers, and the lesser the government's control of the military becomes. More support, less paranoia. Encourage inter-service war games. Remove General HQ's command role. Fight inter-service corruption. Support from this is 40%. Paranoia will increase if they're not equal with each other. Hmm. Minus 25%. Let's go out of it put up power. Um, promote officers. You get more support, less army XP, less IJN support. More paranoia. Huh. 80%, 45%. Hmm, I could want to increase this. I don't want to lower this support too much, but we can do this one. There you go. 50% versus 77.5%. All right, well, bombshell evidence. With great care on the part of the forensics team, they managed to triple the quantity of evidence found from the bomb components retrieved from the corpse. And in total, they found three fingerprints. One retrieved from the corpse, oh, just beneath the ring of the finger of the grenade. Another on its handle and a lone thumbprint on the space. As for the rest of the parts, nothing else could be found in them, as it seemed that whoever had assembled the bomb would have become careless at the critical moment, perhaps overcome with fear of handling live explosives. And in terms of sheer force, the bomb itself was nothing extraordinary. It was nothing more than a hand grenade with a few gunpowder gunpowder charges, wirely, crudely wired to the rudimentary. Oh, look at that. Um, <clears throat> timing device. By the bomb squad's estimation, they had not noticed the bomb that when they did it likely would have gone off within half an hour. A fortunate break to say the least. Likely it was not meant as some form of convoluted terror attack, but as a means of destroying evidence. With well, the added benefit of another layer of intimidation. But what the bomb lacked in power it made up for its alarming nature. How was it that a military issued grenade could appear to appear of all places? To answer the question, the detective could only turn to the aforementioned fingerprints, which of course entailed the long and arduous task of visually comparing the prints with nearly endless collection in Tokyo police records. With nothing else to be done, the detective sadly picked up the case files from his desk and began the long march to the records room. Police work isn't all cartridges and gunfights, you know. Mongolian Civil War. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. You know what? Um, I don't want them to lose. I want them to actually take these guys out. So, I think we'll come back and uh, we'll totally not do some funky stuff off screen. The redacted record. Much to the detective's delight. The process of comparing and matching the fingerprints had taken less time than he anticipated. By working with just a handful of junior officers to the bone for a few days, he managed to compile a stack of probable matches in the correcting or corresponding files, of course. Most were rough approximations, and they were limited to those who had their fingerprints on the file ready, but there was little else that could be done. Most of the profiles from the potential matches were typical Tokyo criminal lowlife. Thugs and drug dealers, low-level gangsters, and enforcers are prototypical scum that the police force fought against. But while most normally fit the character profile, not any obvious meaningful connection to the particular circumstances of the crime. But for one such record, that lack of detail only drew more suspicion. There was onset a prints that matched those found in the bomb quite uh, quite closely, de debatably the closest of them all. But the only file corresponded to was a single redacted arrest record, the original source of the prints. Both the name and circumstances of the crime had been struck from the record, generously coated in black ink bars that dotted the page. Beyond that, there was no reason given for why the record had been censored, no accompanying paperwork no notice the change. The only pieces of identifying information were the picture of unnamed men, an average-sized man with short black hair and a scar of gas above... Uh, his right eye, and the name of the filing officer, some Takahata down at the Central Police Station. Perhaps he'd be able to offer some insight. I'll call a cab. As we're minimizing expenditures. Adjust the budget. Fudge some numbers. Meet the investors. Adjust the budget. Another issue is in the budget, which is in need of updating. The needs of our brave armies and courageous needies are constantly shifting. So the needs of the helpless peoples of the sphere who need our benevolence. We should continue to adjust the budget accordingly. The burn files. The next day, the detective got the bad news from one of the officers who had been stationed to guard the crime scene of the plant. It turns out the forensic teams had not been as thorough as they thought, and ended up missing something really important. After the detectives and specialists had left the scene for the night, the officer diligently patrolled the grounds on high alert for any sign of the killer returning to the scene of the crime, but as he made his way past the plant, he found what they had missed. A small pile of ashes on top of a faint scorch marks on the ground, long since cooled by the night air in order to begin to spread over the surrounding area, motivated by the infrequent gusts of wind. 
Among the ashes were there were a few scraps and shreds of paper, some of them were with marginally discernible writings on them. From the various bits that were found that could still be read, it was obvious that the papers had once been files or records of some sort, and they had been burned extremely recently, but where had they just come from? Was this the killer's true objective and the murder was just incidental? Or were they related? Either way, the detective wasn't going to leave it up to chance. Better scraps and nothing, I guess. And the terrace mountains. Like a hammer hitting hot iron, the rain pounded upon the quaint town of Sapa. The soldiers of the fire team stayed inside the villa, warming themselves by the stove outside. Fog and rain obscured their view of the rice terraces. Only a faint green tinge reminded the soldiers that they were there. They sipped hot tea, steeped with leaves from the nearby fields, for such cheap tea was rather strong and warmed their souls as the weather stole heat. A loud knock on the door turned their attention away from their conversation. The leader, Hayato, stood up and opened the door. Standing on the porch, clutching a parasol and attempting to carry what seemed to be a heavy tray covered in cloth, was a shivering girl. Couldn't have been more than ten, he surmised. Hayato raised his eyebrows, letting the girl in. She was emotionless and any sympathy not revealing itself. Hayato took the tray from her. She was struggling to carry it, and the girl sat in relief. He lifted the cloth, checking to make sure it was not explosives. On the tray was an assortment of wheel-shaped pastries. They reminded Hayato of Chinese mooncakes, albeit without the elaborate design stamped on time. He brought it over to the men, who were delighted to have some snacks, cutting the cake in eights. The cakes went well with the tea. The flavors of durian, of mung bean paste, and sometimes even salty egg yolk somehow melted together with a drink. I ought to greatly enjoy them in turn to thank the girl. She was long gone, having returned to her parents. As we're continuing to build ourselves up, and up in smoke. Despite the best efforts of the detective and the staff in the forensic lab, hardly anything could be gleaned from the blackened scraps of paper that had been retrieved from the crime scene. Many of the scraps that had survived were extremely brittle and fragile, splitting into smaller pieces or dissolving into ash at the slightest touch. But really, this was no great loss, because most were either already unreadable, or contained contextless words and fragments of sentences that proved no leads or useful information. The only thing that was somewhat readable were the centers of a few pages of the latter half of the pile. Their headers and margins had been swallowed up by the flames and circling the remaining text in black rings, however. This meant that there was no names or otherwise identifying information to be found among the lucky survivors. All they were given were some rough description of a fish plant and its operation, nothing to suggest why it had been chosen for the crime. One thoroughly burned scrap made a few references to payment, but gave no context to suggest that it was concerned with anything more than standard business transactions. With nothing else to be done, the detective begrudgingly placed the ashen pages back into their dedicated environment-proof bag and returned them to the evidence locker. Despite the flames, the lead had gone cold. If only it had been faster. Which, I don't know, should have done something different? I don't know. I don't like how the system's been set up, and we just don't know how to do this correctly. Um, also, like I, like I said before, I don't know which way to go, so you guys let me know. Uh, which way we should go? Ketoite, Reformist, Independent, Conservative, Technocrat? I don't know who has content and who doesn't, so I'll look it up, but we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll... If the, whoever has the most votes will go that way, but we'll see what happens. I, I really don't know. So, the leaky faucet gets a wrench. Because of how late it has been when the body was found, most of the plant workers had likely been gone when the crime took place their entire shifts, having ended many hours before the cells or the call came in. That meant, for the most part, they would be able to provide very little detail about the circumstances of the crime when the detective came knocking, however, one worker, a shift lead, had been passing by that plant on his way home when he happened to see a suspicious figure on the property, and then decided to call the police. When the re responding officers arrived, he let them inside to search the premises, where they found the body. While the detective and the forensic teams worked the site, he stayed to give his testament or in his statement, but left not long after. Eager to get a more detailed and complete testimony, the detective got his name from the deputies who took his statement and confirmed it against the name the dispatcher received during the initial call. Over the next few days, he made several calls to the shift managers, a listened at number, while intermittently interviewing other workers, but each time he received no reply. Eventually, the detective got fed up and went to the man's address in person to confront him. But when he got there, he found the front door slightly ajar. After calling out a few times and identifying himself as police, the detective pulled his pistol from his holster and carefully entered the house. In the first room, past the front hall, the detective found the shift manager laying down in a pool in a partially dry blood. This is just the beginning, and... Maijiten no Hogyo Han Saikai Kinin. Today, the 50th anniversary of the passing of Emperor Meiji was observed. Major prisons in Kyoto, Osaka, and Tokyo were organized. Many schools have prepared special lessons on life and the deeds of the late emperor, and the Kyoto Imperial University released a three-volume biography. The first about his life before the restoration up until the abolishment of the Han system. The second about courtly life and reforms in the early period, and the third about his later life starting from the sign of Japanese War of 1894. The emperor lived through the important renovation of Japanese state and culture. Born in Kyoto the year before the Commodore Perry forced ba uh, Baku... Fu, to open the country to which led to the actions that participated in bringing it down and leading the way towards imperial rule in 1868. Under his wise oversight, Japanese society experienced a breakneck modernization. Modern schools, industrial bases, and a modern army was developed, most importantly. The Maiji constitution was established under his reign, which continues to be upheld even to this day, in addition to setting up the initial vestiges of the Japanese Empire in Chozon and Taiwan. While the Japanese people revere the contributions made by Meiji, Maiji, whether his legacy is upheld until his day is still up for debate, especially amidst the corruption and bureaucratic chaff of the current administration. 
Tenno Haika Banzai. Me with investors. Among the most important figures keeping the economy of the sphere running are the investors of the Empire. These hard-working and immoral men wisely use their funds to invest in the Empire's prosperity and help it grow further. The most prominent of these are the Zaibatsu, who pour money into Japan's projects within the sphere to talk about further prosperity and harmony. We should talk to these men and see if they're willing to give more of their finance and spirit to empower Japan. A hospital call. Hayashi le leaned his bike towards his home, a hut made of wood, close to the sea, letting the wall support it from falling. He took his glasses to from his shirt pocket and looked out into the sea, where the sun was halfway across the horizon. The electric lights, strung like a pearl necklace, began turning on, faint but evescent against the incandescence. Waves lapped the gray sand of the coast with pieces of wet floatsome strewn across its surface. When his eyes passed through the lenses, he saw the world. The blobs and blotches became sharp and defined, the miracles of modern science. He thought there was nothing wrong with his eyes, up until his local doctor recommended him an, op an optician. Wearing his first pair of spectacles was an experience, a discovery. He'd never seen the world as clearly as he did under the eaves of two concave lenses. Father, a voice said from the inside, are you there? The doorknob turned and Takeshi stepped out, the last shreds of sunlight dying on the slopes of his chin. A plain-faced young man whose work in the dirty marketplace concealed a brilliant mind, a scholarship in Tokyo. Hayashi was proud this kid would go far. There you are, Takashi said, smiling, trying to hide the worrisome gleam in his eyes. How was the catch? Rough, Hayashi said, downcast. We'll have, to, we'll have enough, however. The situation has become awkward. Well, Takashi stammered, a, a cane is in the hospital. Hayashi's eyes widened, and the 17-year-old Akane, the cusp of her youth, had to lie in a hospital bed afflicted with some illness. Shredding his bike, Hayashi said to his son, I won't be home for dinner tonight. What illness? Oh, liberal democracy is no leader. Cool. Uh, I was going to come over here and see this as well. Paranoia, we want to keep it low. So it's 70% versus 65%. So we just need to raise this by 5. Um, trying to bounce this kind of sucks. Uh, minus 10%, minus 10%, minus 10%, minus 10%, plus paranoia. So now we're at 70%, and now you're at 67 If we do this... Uh, whoops, maybe we shouldn't do that one. We need more 5%. What was my bad? Huh. Or, uh, we should have this by 5%. Increase by 2.5%. Oh, god dang it. Uh, we'll wait till next month. Twins in death. Unfortunately, the chef worker who was left in a grisly state similar to that of the victim. His chef and stomach were covered in nearly a dozen slashes and stab wounds. His neck bore a matching wound, deep and savage, like the fine wound that had drained the life from the poor man, and once again the same ominous mark appeared to gouge into the flesh and accented by dry blood. Chin Moku silence. This time, however, rather than being proudly and bully displayed in the center of the chest, the shift worker's mark was etched into his left shoulder. But where the previous victim's character had been smooth and deliberate, with neatly traced lines, this one was shaky and jagged. The killer must have been in a hurry. The detective concluded, basing his judgment off the contemporary, comparatively sloppy work. This wasn't a carefully planned, premeditated murder. This was on a whim or perhaps out of necessity. But this, beyond the sign of the killer's gruesome hate, or haste, there was little more to be gleaned from the body. It seems the speed did not quite translate to carelessness on the part of the killer. Still, the splatters and drops of blood found around the entryway demonstrated that this had been no simple test. The shift lead must have fought every step of the way against his vicious assailant, fiercely resisting him from the moment he burst through the door up right until his collapse into this final resting place on the living room floor. But it wasn't enough. One hundred and two point eight percent. Then after the meeting, tracking down Officer Tahara. Takahara was easy enough. His schedule for the day had scheduled him to be on call from the Tokyo Central Police Station itself. The detective felt somewhat weird about confronting a fellow police officer about a crime of this caliber. However, he figured that the officer would be able to provide some alibi or correct some misunderstand, uh, misunderstood detail on their part. So he gathered up a small squad of officers and fellow detective, and he made their way down to the central station. Once there, with a quick flash of their badges and certain relaying of their intent, they were waved past the front desk and towards the general officer's hall. At first, the group could not seem to find Officer Takahara amidst the regular daily hustle and bustle of the station's officers, but one of those colleagues was kind enough to inform them that Takahara had stepped back out for a small break. With a curt thank you, the detective turned to the door at the far end of the room that led to the back entrance of the station. It seemed falling behind him. When he pushed the heavy metal door open, he saw no sign of Takahara, but heard some hushed words float from around the corner. Now waiting for the rest of his team to come through the door, the detective briskly rounded the corner in search of the source of their voice. There he found himself face to face with Officer Takahara, who himself had been locked in conversation with another man who looked quite like him in passing, save for the deep scar above his right eye. There was a brief moment of silence as the three men stared at each other, but it lasted no longer than the time it took for them to reach for the weapons. The first sound was nearly the detective's shout of police, but it was just barely beaten by, up by gunshot. Shot fired. A diagnosis. 
Hayashi-san, the doctor said. His words clad in a clinical concern as spick and span as his lab coat. Please follow me to my room. We need to discuss the specifics of Akain-chan's situation. Hayashi was familiar with such demeanor. The manic in his old platoon often carried the same weary and stoic expression whenever he had to convey bad news. Trailing behind the door, Hayashi glanced at the window, uh, past the window, at the high silhouette that blocked his view to the sea. The chemical factory, one of Minamata's proudest centers of employment, loomed its waste pipes directed coastwards. Entering the doctor's room, they sat down across one another. The doctor sat behind his desk, pulling a file out of the drawer. Monochrome photographs seemed to spill out of the manila polar cover. I am sure the doctor said that you have seen Akachan's symptoms over the past few weeks. Stammered words, uneven gait, and even strange convulsions, fingers that curl into claws. I have, as a father, Hayashi. could only give answers that might help speed up his daughter's recovery and let the medicine man go to work. Do you know the cause? After a brief pause, the doctor answered, See these photographs here? Fingers, weak muscles, twisted limbs. I know you're not the one to be peeved at this sort of thing, Hayashi-san. He nodded. The doctor was right. All the victims had the same kind of diet. Fish or shellfish. Don't take my word for it, he stroked his chin. But I think the factory over there might be suspect. Heavy metal poisoning. A cane is one of the lighter cases. But it'll be better if she doesn't eat fish from the Minamata area. Are you sure that's, it's a fault of the factory? 70 to 80 percent? Yeah. Hayashi immediately knew what to do. A fisher's a father's love lies above heaven and earth. And Showa no he, or hi. Rejoice and cheer carried throughout the streets of the Empire of Japan in celebration of the birthday of the Emperor Showa. His Imperial Majesty's New Year of Life is commemorated by all from Taiwan to Hokkaido, in a festival honoring the age of priests, fraternity, and cooperation Japan and its Asian brothers now live in. During the reign of the Emperor Showa, the Empire had grown in strength and in size to international superpower status. Now, no one dares challenge Japan like they did before the rule of his Imperial Majesty. It was under his rule that the Empire won against imperialism in the Greater East Asia War, and under his rule that the mighty Corpora Spiritsphere was founded to preserve the sacred peace. Millions gathered to observe the holiday in public or at home to wish good health upon the Emperor, so that his prosperous and just rule may continue Continue along into the future. Tendo Haika Banzai. Keep going up, keep growing, growing, growing. We got stuff to do here. Um, such as expenditure. Eh, could have done more, but we're not going to. A gatekeeper. For a Hayashi, today should have been another day of work. As soldier turned fisherman, he didn't have much time or holidays for vacations. Takeshi and Arcane, Arcane, depended on him, and at the very least, he would see them complete their educations. To his children, as his, to his state, duty was everything. In the bright glare of the morning sunlight near the factory's opening hours, as the winds were blowing out to the sea, he and the local veterans stood by its gates, preventing anyone from leaving and entering. When the police came to dissuade him, they banished the rifles and machetes, rendered no less dull nor deadly by the years spent in unuse. When the police threatened to evict them forcibly from the premises, they fired a few warning shots, finally as a last resort. The police sent a friend of Hayashi's, a local bar owner, to meet him with him. From a distance, he looked ridiculous, the skin and complexion of a man unused to exertions happening under the sunlight, much less in the early morning, Hayashi-san, the bar owner said. Have you gone mad? Have you cracked? If you stand down now, they'll let you go. You're a veteran, Hayashi-san, and they respect that. Not enough, Hayashi said, apparently. Me and the boys here have only one condition, a meeting with any official. Scratch that, prefectural officials. I need someone who can do something regarding this. He pointed his chin to the factory. This monstrosity, that's all. I stand down once I know who I'm talking to. By the midday, the news had spread across the country. In the evening, it would reach the ears of the Prime Minister Eno. A new scandal? A view from the ground. The detective's vision was blurry. The shapes and colors of the world merged and melted with each other. With each blink, his eyelids became heavier and heavier, flicking his vision between the indiscernible fog and total darkness. But for a moment, with a great amount of effort on the detective's part, his vision became clearer. He saw the scarred man in front of him, face down against the hard concrete ground. His hands were cuffed behind him, and the boot of a police officer was placed squarely on his back. Turning his eyes a bit, he could see a small pool of blood forming beneath him, trickling out of the dark hole in his leg. The detective also became aware of the fact that the world around him was quite loud. The sounds appeared distant and garbled, but he had been so focused on looking that he had hardly noticed them at all. With each and with yet more effort, the detective strained to hear the sounds of the surroundings. First he heard the groanings of the scarred man in front of him, soft and indistinct. Next came the repeated pops and cracks of gunfire, accompanied by occasional whizzing of bullets and rumbles of impact. Finally he turned to see one of the officers that had accompanied him, crouching behind a crate and screaming into his radio. For a moment their eyes met and he saw fear, confusion, and above all, loss. And then, as the detective's eyelids fell for one last time, the words he shouted became clear. Requesting backup to our location immediately, we were taking fire from a police officer in the southeastern exterior of the central station. Officers, officers down, I repeat. Officers are down. But we ain't done. We're still adjusting the goddamn budget. And there's a ton of reading to do. Ooh. A quandary. Every day, Takeda drove Prime Minister Ino into his office to, in the National Diet. On the way there, they passed by crowds of people going to work on foot, ready to earn their living. The wooden innards of Tokyo appeared here and there, but they mostly saw only the stony modern facades of the finance and commercial office complexes. 
Inosama, Takeda said to Ino. Have you decided what to do with the, uh, Takeda's voice died off as he tried to recollect his pivotal name? Minamata veteran. He's everywhere in the news nowadays. Seemed like trouble. The Prime Minister reclined in the seat of the back of the car deep in thought. Takeda-kun, Ino said. It has slipped my mind earlier. Thank you for reminding me. After a moment in several avenues, Takeda spoke. You know Inosama. My father's a veteran. Fought in China and everything. If he knew that some big wig corporation had put chemicals in my water, he would be enraged in the same way as this Minamata person. Takeda adjusted the rearview mirror as he stopped by traffic light. I sympathized, is all. You're not usually this talkative. Did you find what the man said righteous? No, 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 Takeda said, stammering. I just found him understandable. Coming from a veteran's family in a lower voice, he continued. When I was little, my father would usually wake up screaming. Now he just sits on the veranda. Under the cares, his eyes blank. He felt as if his country had left him behind. When the Richard died, building Eno got out of the car and addressed the chauffeur. You might have a point. I appreciate your advice. I remember I told this one last time. I, I, morally, I have to do this one. I have to do this one. I do have a sense of morals somewhere deep within me. Maybe, but he might just have a point. I, I don't want to do a disappearance. I don't want to do a disappearance. I can't do it. I can't do it. Genociding people is fine, but, but for a father and his daughter, I have to do it. And other kids too, but you know, whatever. A proper thing. Have you handled the matter? You know, said to the receiver. I want to see that factory closed tomorrow. No operation will resume. No, nothing. If I find out that the veteran is still there, the deal is off. I cannot protect you from the media backlash that you would have to handle yourself. I understand, you know, Sama. The voice over the phone said, belonging to a prominent tycoon who owned the Ch Chiso Corporation. I must say, this is most uncharacteristic of you. With so much power in your hands, Satoko, the Kenpai Tai, it would have been far easier to handle this matter discreetly. Still, I would not complain. The Chiso Corporation would be more than happy to receive compensation over the government's requ requisition of its facilities in Minamata. The voice paused as if, as if to touch uh, on a poignant, prominent point. You know, Sama, if I may ask, when will the transfer be? Today, tomorrow, next week, I don't know. It'll get there, I'm sure, as soon as I can clear the waves. You know, the usual stuff. One cannot be too careful nowadays. Too many eyes watching from the shadows, the independence, the media. Everything is a right mess over here. I admire discretion, you know, Sama. Now, if you'll excuse me, my timetable waits. The business of conducting business. A sigh, farewell. Two, killing two birds with a single stone. Oh, inflation is going way back up. And it looks like Salvin isn't doing so well right now. I'm halfway tempted to just do military austerity right now. Hmm. There's only 15 political power, too. 50% less. But then again, I don't want her to growth, so... I think we'll be okay. Poor Salvin. Poor, poor Salvin. Vernudinsk. Social policies, huh? Minority, state oppression. Nice. Economic policies, not bad. Low income weighted. Stage 2. The development of Tokuku, a case that occurred while collecting evidence, I strongly suggested that the, mount, the motivation for murder is far more complex and calculated than initially thought. thought excuse me. With a revelation, a revelation that the killing itself was carried by a former soldier, who had seemingly no obvious relation to the victim, the investigation took on a new character. Where the officers of the ward station once combed through the gory details of the case over tables across the desks, there was new only a short, stern silence. Hushed conversations were held behind closed doors, locks on file of the cabinets were now checked and double-checked, and notebooks became carefully guarded realms of speculation and secrets. No commander or directive brought this culture of silence to the station, it was ushered in by the demeanor of the chief detective. He had steadily become more stoic and withdrawn as the days went by. He answers to previous questions spawned questions of their own, and long, before long the case loomed like a hydra over the department. Given the general sense of turmoil, it was all more surprising when the chief gathered the department before him one morning and announced that the investigation was moving on to the next stage. The teams would be reorganized with a shift away from field work, and focus on filling the holes in the case with paper. Each group would be responsible for interacting with, requesting, and securing information from a different administrative office. Most importantly, the specific objectives of and information obtained by each group would be strictly localized, only known within the group and to the central command of the investigation. The chief did not offer justification for that change, but none was really needed. Afterwards, the detective paused to run his eyes over the rows of silent, stone-faced men for him, looking for any sign of concern or confusion. Finally, he broke the silence. No questions he asked, but the stoic men kept their silence, glancing between themselves and the detective. Okay, then he continued, this is what we're going to do. The investigation, of course, now gains momentum. Finally, we have adjusted the budget. Uh, so we're at 67 and a half. There's a 5% difference. So if we go up by 5% more here, 77.5, let's go down by 2.5. If we go 5% more here, this goes up to 72 and a half, while this drops down to 70%. Hmm. Plus 10 more here. Hmm. Or we lower this by 5, and this goes up by 2.5. There we go. 
Oh, crap. Now it's 70% and 67 and a half. God dang it. I mean, that's so close. It's so close. We need less paranoia, but eventually. It's fine. Lower support for both. Get both as well. God dang it. I tried, guys. I tried. Crushed underfoot. After the allegations of corruption within the Eno government, student demonstrations had gathered around the various locations of Tokyo, with a large group outside of the National Dye Building. They waved placards and wore masks to cover their mouths, while chanting slogans and chimes to mock Prime Minister Eno from the streets. Photographers danced around the boundaries of the groups of protesters. A momentary glance of a camera flash caught these moments in time. Umbrellas freckled throughout the swarm of protesters, lifted in a colorful display of greens, whites, and reds. The chance and chatter of these streets was booming and the commotion was shaking. It seemed as if there was little order at all. That was until a horn signaled from the west side of the street and the attention of the tremors, tremendous crowd shifted to the left. A great line of horses stood by the west side opening of the street, backed by ranks of what appeared to be the Metropolis Police or Metropolitan Police. They were fitted with independent or deep in deep navy blue armor satchels and with small shields and batons and other riot control gear to face the protesters. There was a silence for a moment as the protesters turned to face the police. But as the horn wailed again and the horses charged into the thickness of the crowds, uh, <clears throat> screams began to echo from the streets. The blunt force and violence between law and authority and the protesters descended onto the streets, and hundreds of unarmed students dissipated into the surrounding areas to avoid po police bludgeoning and arrests. The violence and screams filled this district, only matched by the hiss of horse water hoses used to punish the protesters further, and the armor-clad police continued to march past the die building in a regiment at Hulk King Trudge. Nothing to see here, of course. Nothing to see. You hear nothing, we know nothing. Learning the rules. Oh, look. Higher growth. Evidence to suggest the existence of a wider conspiracy theory does not, in turn, give evidence to boldly bursting our way through the organs of state on the pretense of obstruction of justice, said the chief detective, slowly pacing before his men. Rather, we must take the opposite position, in a sense. We must carefully plan our actions before we make them, as well as anticipate and prepare for the result of said actions. He came to a stop and turned to gaze over the uniformed soldiers, assembled, or sole officers assembled, in rows of chairs before him. He knew all their faces, the names that went with them, and the desks they normally appear behind. Some of them were veterans of the service, officers and detectives who had given a large portion of their lives to the Tokyo Police Service. Others were newer, recent graduates from police academies, transfers from other departments, or military men who wanted to change a pace. Weighing this, the chief resumed. Previously, we have used our obligation to enforce the law like a hammer, smashing aside all obstacles to reveal the information we desire, however. Here, we the key is superior to the battering ram. The fierce rivalries between and within the branches of the military and government have encouraged the growth of a culture of unhindered opportunism. It permeates throughout the offices and conference rooms of administration and clouds the judgment of those within. That is a weakness we must exploit. The conditions that motivate the crime will be its perpetrator's undoing. With that, he gathered his papers from the podium in front of him into a pile, straightened it with two quick taps against the podium, and walked from the meeting room. As soon as it disappeared from the doorway, his subordinates rose with a chorus of lug chairs scraping against linoleum floors and set to their task. Nobody said it would be easy, and the green light. A restaurant sits at a street corner, the clashing pots and the boiling of steam emanating from inside. A small woman, firmly gripping her purse, enters the restaurant and walks by the counter, staring at the cooks while doing so. She enters the kitchen wherein one of the cooks collects a... <clears throat> wadded a bell from her hand before ushering her down a ladder hidden underneath some floorboards. She takes a seat in a circle of chairs, unfurling a book from her bag, a poorly manufactured, poorly kept novel by the 1920s America. Under the scratches and tears, it, it, it tears, tears. the title reads, The, the gra that Gats By. The book club meeting goes on by as it normally does. She sits there, quiet, listening to the others discuss the themes and meanings of Tom Buchanan as a character, or the rosy-colored moving room of page 10 and whatnot. A discussion of the first chapter flies by, all while she stares down at a copy of the book. Are those eyes she can make out on the cover? Her attention is caught by someone offhandedly mentioning the green light in the bay. Well, the translation was unclear, but she was pretty sure the green light sat under the water of the bay. She raises her voice. After thinking about it, I have a guess for what the green light might represent. Looking around, she readies her throat. The green light is both Daisy and the American Dream. Gatsby begins his life as a poor man, which is why he can't marry Daisy when he wants to. It works up to a position of wealth, only to find that he still can't marry Daisy. Wealth does not change his heritage, or his new money personality. Both Daisy and the American Dream it lie underneath the water, out of reach. It, <clears throat> it represents how the American Dream isn't real. The idea that any man can be a parvenu, just as in true, money can't break culture and tradition, even in the American Golden Age. The book club falls silent. Even though no one says so, they can't help but make the connections of the American dream to themselves. They sit here, reading shoddily made novels in a dingy restaurant basement. The emperor is a master of Asia. They formed a pan-Asian brotherhood of nations across the Pacific, and yet here they are. Where's the glory? Justice. No different. Not so different. At all. Now are they? One, two, five, eight point nine six one billion. Oh my god. 
Friends of friends in the right places. The smoke from the chief detective's cigarette wafted towards the ceiling as he leaned back in his chair office. It rolled past the frosted glass windows that separated his office from the common area that housed the desk of the department officers and detectives. Two of such detectives sat in front of him now, each in an uncomfortable mental, me, mental metal chair half a meter away from the hulking mass of polished wood that served as the chief's desk. One was senior detective Kodera, a long-standing veteran of the Tokyo police, his age beginning to show in the wrinkles around his eyes and the dusting of gray hairs on his head. The other was a younger man transferred from a department in Osaka named Tachi. He had served as an officer for a number of years prior, followed by a handful more as a detective. While the senior remained somewhat relaxed in his chair, the young detective leaned forward to speak. What I'm trying to say, sir, he began, is that given the circumstances, it would make sense to establish an informal network inside key offices before, beforehand, before rather than try to build a network of contacts as we go along. The chief tapped a cigarette on the rim of a glass ashtray, one of the few things that sat on his otherwise barren desk. What do you mean by informal, he asked. Unofficial connections mostly, Kodera interjected. Formal, former contacts for old cases, friends of friends, all army buddies, whatever, people who we could ask to take care of the pen and paper tasks that bureaucrats are usually are not so motivated to do. All with the understanding that their effort is deeply appreciated by the Tokyo Police Service, who will happily remember or forget their contributions depending on what they, of course, prefer. And because of the rather sensitive nature of the operation, Tachi said, we think to best limit our network to one of our major government group working groups. Otherwise, we risk alerting the conspirators. If they find out half of their office goes down for coffee at the station once a week, for our purposes, we recommend either the Army, Navy, or the Diet Administration, sir. The Army. Oh, we're on air speed. We'll go this one, then. And it's still only September. Fudge the numbers. Some part of the budgets are unappealing. If the Diet or the public see any of these concerning figures and parts of the budget and economics data, there will be unrest and the kok Kokutai will be in severe danger. In order to avoid this, we should discreetly change some of the statistics in order to maintain absolute stability in Japan, after all. Knowing them only worsen the lives of the people and bring a malaise to the Yamato spirit. Paper Tigers. The chief detective sat behind his desk, carefully flicking through his roll of contact cards. Each card was given at least a moment's worth of attention, enough to read the name stamped on in a blank black ink. Most of them were immediately flicked past and forgotten, but a few were worthy of another moment of consideration, and fewer still made the detective pause altogether. He searched for the names of the people in the same way one would search for the name on the street, unconcerned with the memories, thoughts, and feelings related to the names, but only their usefulness as a path from one place to another, but the roads he sought led to another heart of the Imperial Monolith, and neither were easily found nor traversed, uh, doubly so in the case of the Tax Bureau and Board of Audit. The Tax Bureau was the attack dog of the Ministry of Finance. Many aspiring gang leaders or captains of industry had their dreams dashed by the discerning gaze and careful calculations of its agents. The Bureau demanded information in the torrents of paperwork for accuracy, consistency, and redundancy, and had amassed a hoard of data in an impossibly intricate filing system. It nearly an intelligence agency in its own right, and devoted to the single purpose of following and securing the revenue of the Empire. By contrast, the Board of Audit was a reclusive agency, shunned by the ministries of the uh, Cabinet. This made little difference to its officials. In some sense, it was preferable. They existed to examine the finances and records of the various public institutions that spread around the empire. But the board's position in the hierarchy was artificial. In a sense, they reported to the Diet, but were subordinate only to the emperor. While they acted with the divine purpose of exposing the subversives who exploited the empire for personal gain, and had done so in the past from town to town, in recent years, the office had fallen silent. The chief leaned back in his chair, judge, juggling an unit or unlit cigarette between his fingers. Two names now sat before him, one to each office. He considered for a moment longer, then reached forward to pick up the phone. Ask an auditor, a tax man. Hmm. Which one do we want to do? I don't remember which way we went last time. Hmm. Intelligence agency its own right. Securing revenue. Reclusive agency down here. Um, everyone knows about the tax man. I feel like I'm going to do the wrong one here. I don't know if we're going to do this right or wrong. Uh... It, this has fallen silent, though. It sounds like this one should be it, but let's go to the tax man first. The parallel approach. Detectives Tachi and Kodera stood under the canopy that covered the entrance of the Tokyo Central Police Station. They stood side by side, not quite facing each other, but not quite facing away. Their backs to the door. Each held a cigarette. Of course, smoke, smoke. Tachi in his left hand and Kodera in his right, which they would raise to their lips every now and then. Between them, four cigarettes butts sat crushed on the ground. How it seems to me, said Kodera, pausing to pull on a cigarette, is that we have two angles to approach the case at. One is through the killer himself, who he was, where he came from, how he ended up here, his tragic backstory, all that nonsense. The other is through the circumstances of the killing. What did it happen, where it did, and when it did, and in the way that it did. And you think it's a matter of picking the right one, Tachi asked? That's just it, Kodera asked, or replied, eagerly inhaling another puff. If there really is a conspiracy, <clears throat> or at least one going further than we found already, then none of those details would have been left a chance. But what I mean is, it's not just about where those angles lead, it's about where they overlap. Tachi turned to look at him. So what do you suggest, he asked. Two teams, each of us leading one. One focuses on the criminal, the other on the crime. We keep 
the specifics local ter or ter teams, which you and I meet privately to discuss, compare, and coordinate. Maximum coverage, minimal risk, and you know how much I enjoy rooting through the personal effects of the deranged and disturbed, Kodera said with a smirk. But I think I'll let you take the lead in that respect, seeing as you, you've yet to have the chance since we got here. Consider this an impromptu field lecture on Tokyo criminal psychology, he said, bringing the remains of a cigarette back to his lips. Tachi flashed a quick smile, smile, quick smile smiled in reply, before he dropped the smoldering ends of a cigarette on the ground and crushed it beneath the sole of his scuffed leather shoes. That sells it then. Also, <clears throat> I was thinking, uh, when we do have the whole crisis here, I wonder what's going to happen to our credit rating. Like, oh, well, maybe the message is done, which is good. But, uh, yeah, I wonder what's going to happen to this. I'm, I'm pretty sure we won't go straight to junk. Um, we'll probably get it to fair, maybe. Maybe, maybe mediocre, maybe max, but... We're looking pretty good right now, but we just got a few more dollars, and of course you and me, we're going to fudge the numbers. If you want to read this again, please go right ahead. <clears throat> but since we have this, and I've been trying to pay off a lot of debt, doesn't help that much, but I'll take whatever we can grab. Happy October, everybody. Knowing what we don't know. Five men crowded around the war table in the meeting room of the war police station. Three were police officers, each clad in dark blue uniform and carrying a shining badge of office and a clip at the waists. The two others were detectives. Tachi had another recent transfer to the team. All of them leaned over a collage of files, documents, and pictures carefully arranged in a half circle around the dick picture of Ryo Takahara. So in total, said Ta Tachi. The four other men turning to face him as he spoke. We all know three central things about the Takahara here. First, that he killed Shinji Yoshikagi in a very specific manner, despite no apparent relation between them. Second, he is a member of the armed forces, very likely the army, and thirty and a half brother in the Tokyo police force willing to assist him. The rest of the group nodded in reply. So, that gives us with two major avenues of investigation to continue. With a military angle, finding out what the military knew about him and what he did for them. Or we can cover the basics, as we would in a normal case. Establish a broader back or background, get a general sense of who he was as a person, what his social groups were, his habits, and so on. Regardless, our goal is to construct a motivation for his prior actions, and from there try and form a reasonable connection to further parties. Three of the older other men nodded again, but the fourth, a bright-eyed young officer from the south, cleared his so to speak, sir. Given the circumstances of the case, that is, the fact that a suspect had a brother in the police force, should we consider that angle of an investigation too? Tachi hesitated a moment before replying. At this stage, we are missing so much of the basic facts of the case, I don't think we can make real headway in a related internal investigation at the moment. If there's more to be found inside the force, going in blind will only make it more difficult. So with all that being said, I propose we take the military route, basic profile. I'm not sure which one I chose last time, so we're just going to go with the basic profile. That seems, um, really basic. <laughs> to do the basic profile. Expand lobbying. <clears throat> Conserve the ooh, industrial freedoms, build a diet, wrangle the governor's generals, slightly more debt, security service, ah, uh, expand lobbying. Our diet has many issues to contend with and is far from all knowing. Lobbying from industries and interest groups should be expanded to allow for greater understanding of the correct path for Japan's future, far from the radical ideas of Japan hating elements. Under the spotlight, Detective Tachi rubbed his eyes and yawned. He sat alone at his desk in the darkened station office. The usual hustle and bustle had long given away to a city silence. His la desk lamp provided a small pool of light, illuminating Tachi as if it were an actor upon a stage. Looking out through the windows, the sky was as dark as the office. But even at this hour, light from, from the car, signs, and streetlights of Tokyo poured through the glass and drew shadows on the walls of the station. Tachi looked back down at the papers arrayed on his desk before him. They were the result of this team's efforts to establish a general background of, the, of on Ryo Takahara. Intention had begun to begin compiling the next day, but Tachi chose to stay late to begin the process himself, not having any spouse or children to return to the like of like some of his colleagues. By all accounts, Takahara was thoroughly average. He had been an average student, both in conduct and exams. He had chosen to enlist in the General Infantry Corps after his final year of school, with no obvious intention of pursuing a specialized role or command. He had been picked up twice for bar fives, but never amounted to anything more than a night in custody. The only noteworthy thing in that respect was around six months ago for the possession of illegal substances. However, no further information was given in the report, as it seems that he was released the next day without incident. The detective frowned. None of the others filed had implied anything related to drugs. But Takahara's medical records were not included in the bundle, as the records were not centralized and tend to move as the patient did, requiring some extra effort to track down, of course. Tachi could not help but notice the curious police record. An apparent repeat offender was consistently let go even after more severe charges were applied. In all likelihood, this was the work of the brother, Officer Takahara, suggesting there was more to the cooperation. I want to review, but I think the last time, let's check down medical records. Let's see what happens with that one. New Don. It's over for the Rex Kumasa. He's days away from pulling entirely. The Americans are already ready to evacuate him any second. The effing useless Americans. Pulling a full-blown Nazi. You know that he used to drive Hitler's motorcade around? That'll be enough. You'll be on a payroll after your final payment comes through. You're free to go. Gabriel thought to the tune of clacking boots, uh, walking out of the small makeshift office. The idea of the CIA interfering was frightening, but it shouldn't affect the situation too much. As he gazed through his office window, the city was already bare of inhabitants. The ancient bubonic plague come again to haunt and inflict woe upon the island of Madagascar, even if the U.S. interfered. They would not find much to interfere with. 
You can make this crap up, Gabriel thought, but he did not say. <clears throat> Instead, he pulled out the phone and started talking to his secretary, asking for one of the officers in his soon-to-be army. Of course, they were not officially enlisted, but the German occupation wasn't official in his eyes as well. The whole world would be privy to that thought uh, soon enough, thought Gabriel. You call for me, sir? Have our soldiers march north. Our success will be stable enough if we do this at the right time, and the right time is now. Tell them to keep the uniforms. I want them to have them burning when I declare our succession. Be quick about it. Tap his money. The soldier said not a word, but his dumb grin that was etched from cheekbone to cheekbone said all Gabriel needed to know. A soldier left, leaving Gabriel to the silence of his office once more. It was good to pull, put those things in motion now. It wouldn't be long until everyone else fell into place. Gabriel eyed up the uh, printed telegram sent from the Kenpai to HQ in Tokyo. It read of Japan's firm commitment to independence, and not just Madagascar, but across Africa and the o Indian Ocean as well. It reeked of hypocrisy, especially with the context Gabriel was intelligent enough to pick up on. But with that, the Germans choosing one side and the Americans choosing the other, what other option do they have? The battle for independence begins. Uh... Did we get involved in Madagascar? I guess so. <clears throat> and we have a cup of coffee to keep the nights warm. Let the medical records show. As expected, finding Takahara's medical records and the webwork of Japanese bureaucracy was no easy task. Many times, det det Detective Tachi's team tracked them down to one clinic or office, yet to only find another notice of transfer. However, eventually, through sheer persistence and a great deal of patience, half a decade's worth of records made their way to the desk of Tokyo Central. The basic details were generally unsurprising, though records described a physically healthy young man, both by civilian and military standards. The statistics lined up with those recorded in the autopsy, and they seemed to be consistent w between each individual file. But the more recent records reveal a pair of intertwined complexities. At some point in the previous years, Rio had begun to spiral into what the doctors had referred to as a persistent depressive state. He de described consistently low moods, trouble eating and sleeping, and increasingly withdrawn disposition. What does he mean? Most notable, the only break in the downward trend seemed to be come around eight months ago, when Rio expressed excitement over kindling the relationship with his brother. But the re re revelations did not end there. A handwritten note was found shoved in the back of a folder containing medical records dated six months ago. It appears to have been written by the doctor who had examined Takahara. Whether it was intended for his own or his patient's reference was unclear. Three pieces of information were written on the note. The words, West Tokyo Behavior Clinic, a phone number, and an address. After consulting a phone book, the team confirmed that all these three pointed to the same place. It was a specialized treatment clinic aimed at combating social diseases such as antisocial behavior, alcoholism, and drug abuse. Well, the specific purpose of the recommendation was not immediately clear to them, or for the team. One, For once, the next move was. A spoonful of sugar helps the audit go down. Oh, we have more production units. Nice. Those who control the present. Looking at a clipboard, Yoshiki scanned the list of names looking for students I hadn't read from the textbook. Her eyes landed upon Kojima Kaitaro. Turning to his direction, she asked, Kaitaro-chan, could you please read this for the class? <clears throat> he silently nodded, turning it to his book. Seemingly had forgotten what the paragraph he was to read, he panicked slightly. The class grew a little louder as whispers between friends began to start. Seeing his dilemma, she saved him. The greedy Chiang government, she loudly whispered. Thanks, Yoshiki. He began to read. The greedy Chiang government in China, in a bid to distract the people of China from the poor lives, staged an incident along the Lugo Bridge in order to start a war. We responded. Kaitaro squinted his eyes appro appropriately. The Chiang government and the communists had been fighting with each other, which destroyed China, but they came together to attempt to hold. Kaitaro stopped, and Yoshiki intervened to save him again. Liberation. Liberation back after a long war. Pan-Asian unity had prevailed, and the Chinese people were happy. <laughs> Kaitaro slumped back in his seat, having played his part. Thank you, Kaitaro. Now, Yoshiki picked up a stack of papers. We'll be doing an activity that will focus on the paragraphs we had just read. Yoshiki-sensei. Will we be learning more about this later? One of our students, Sayo, inquired. Yes, we will learn more about the China War in later grades. Yoshiki passed out the worksheets as her pupils, uh, pupils, pupils began to write as soon as they received the papers. Control the past. The wild ones. Midnight. Shinjuku. The chilly wind snaked through the giant Odaku department stores, but at night, the glitzy shopping and finance district turns into something else entirely. <clears throat> Those who cowered during the day crawl out of their comfort zones at night, and Aka Nakajima is no different. Lighting a cigarette, Aka heaves and leans back into his precious Midori. But Midori is no schoolmate. Neither is she a courtesan. Midori moans louder than any girlfriend Aka has had, and Aka could ride her for hours as much as he pleases. What did I just read? All there is now is silence, and on the unfamiliar hums of other engines coming within earshot. The three rev roar was familiar. It was Ryu and the boys from Setagawa. Coolly, he takes another drag from a cigarette. Aka gestures warmly to the older man. How's that scar treating you, you magnificent Mongol slayer? Quit a kid, you don't know anything until you've been in that crap, replied Ryu dryly. Aka zips up his boiler suit and puts out a cigarette before his ha hachimaki f around his forehead. A sign of rebellion against the state establishment, bikers like Aka take signs of patriotism and own it for themselves. All right, old man, so where do I am taking Midori tonight? Uh, out of the ports. Other side of Tokyo. If we get there by two, why not ride around in Saitama for a bit? The flame of youth is often hard to distinguish. Now what do we want to do here? 
Do we need anything else? We're looking really good for all this stuff, so I might just put on consumer goods so we can make, 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 make. Just so we can build, build, build. Also, I did spend some more political power. Well, off screen, I think, earlier. Um, for consumer goods, so we're max out growth as much as possible. A burst of speed. I'll do one more time. Why not? Screw it. I want more growth. <clears throat> Initially, the staff of the West Tokyo Behavior Clinic was reluctant to cooperate with the investigation. When the rider and telephone messages received no proper reply in return, the team's assistant detective and two officers were to inquire after them personally. Even then, the staff were hesitant to provide any info, even outright questioning the legitimacy of the basis for a request. But after the proper warrants were shown and some cautionary statements about obstruction of justice were given, those meekly stepped aside. Unlike the previous medical records, the files obtained from the clinic were mostly useless. Pages of speculation on the social origin of Takahara's affliction, alongside notes and results from various psychological and physical tests. In fact, the most critical file was the first one in the folder, which detailed the reason which had brought him to the clinic. As a prior police report had hinted, Ryo Takahara had developed a drug addiction, an addiction that, which for almost the past year had been growing worse by the day steadily consuming him. But what was most significant, which was eventually noticed by Detective Kodaira, was that Takahara was specifically addicted to amphetamines. Not only were these generally more expensive than most illegal drugs and notes indicated that he had been taking particularly powerful, long-lasting doses. The question was, how can an ostensibly impoverished soldier get addicted to such an expensive drug? Furthermore, it begs the question as to how he was never reported to have any withdrawal symptoms, especially given the evidence to suggest he was an active member of the military. There's no indication that he sub substituted his usual amphetamines for soldiers' drugs like heroin, but surely the team concluded that it was more information he had to be concerned to concerning Takahara's addiction than the army would have it. Inquire after the army medical records. Not bad. And we're still on 257, which is not bad. And now we are at what? 254? We're still getting there. I want to get at least to 100%. But seek no evil. Or see no evil. <clears throat> Tachi slapped the envelope on Kodaira's desk. Nothing, he said. Exasperated. Over a week of constant inquiries and form requests and all amounts and absolutely nothing. On the other side of the desk, Kodaira was leaning back in his chair, steadily cooling a mug of coffee in his right hand. Kind of like what I'm doing. The last streams of vapors escaping from the ceramic rim. He made no move to pick up the envelope, but rather waited until his younger colleague voiced his frustrations and then spoke himself. The army isn't known for being so quick to share, he said. Tachi shook his head. This can't be a matter of refusal to share. In fact, I'm sure if they had the ability to, they would happily blame Takahara's actions on drugs so they could get, so they could get us to go stay away. No, according to them. They have no record, medical or otherwise. No to suggest that he suffered from any affliction at all, let alone amphetamine addiction. Tachi shook his head. It just can't be the case. It would require such an extreme level of negligence to overlook a heavily withdrawn private that there is almost no way it could be unintentional. Either that or, or Takahara had access to steady supply of rare, expensive drugs while he would deploy it on a military base, Kodara interjected, which would also require a pretty darn big crack in the security to be possible. Yeah, exactly, replied Tachi, so what is it? Kodara rose from his seat, draining the last of his coffee and firmly set the mug on top of his envelope on the desk. I'm not sure he said, but I do know what comes next. Military precision, my booty. I didn't go over the natural spirits, too. Shua Emperor, of course. We have Nihon Ascendant. We have the Zaibatsu question, which hurts our political power by a whole bunch. Holy crap. But an army of the secret next. Sense of security is also very good, too. And that's it. Detective Kodira and Detective Tachi sit just beyond the edge of the chief's detective desk. On the other side of the political pla or Polish plateau, the chief sat preying at the report Kodera had handed him shortly after they walked in the room. His wireframe glasses sat low on his nose as he carefully examined the work of his subordinates line by line. The office was still, the silence only interrupted by the occasional rustling of paper as the chief turned to the page. Finally, the chief. Detective brought the gaze from the papers on his desk and up to meet the eyes of the two men before him. You're certain, he says, he asked. Tachi opened his mouth to reply, but Kodaira beat him to it. Absolutely, sir, he said firmly. The evidence we have compiled based on the prof profile of Takahara simply cannot be dismissed as circumstantial. Every indication suggests that Takahara's motivations were either facilitated by some personnel from the military or army, and made, or made feasible by some failure within the systems. Regardless, the generally poor cooperation shown by the R IRAGS, combined with the almost pathologically insufficient maintenance of records, should provide more than enough grounds to justify a reorientation of the investigation towards the military administration. As he finished, the chief flicked his hard gaze over to Tachi, and you, the chief said. Couldn't have said it better myself, sir, Tachi replied quickly. Well then, said the chief. Slam the report back into its folder and get to, get to it. The investigation is turned to the army. How are we doing here? Uh, not bad. Public is not bad. Uh, independence is not bad. Uh, government stability. 70% uh, still. 72.5. God dang it. Squaring up. If I were to increase this by like 5. And this would decrease it by 2.5. 5 would be 77.5. And this would go down 62.5. Can I increase it by 10? No. It lower by, by 5, too, which would suck. 
The investigation as a whole had grown thoroughly tired of the mostly one-sided conversation with the army. The process of contacting the correct office, requesting the correct form, and gleaning a reply had more in common with pulling teeth and pulling records. Given most of the divisions were trained in desk work and not dentistry, the collective patience for the process evaporated quickly. As a result, the two leading detectives, Kodaira and Tachi, conspired with the chief to come up with a strategy to break the bureaucratic gridlock. Tachi proposed a direct route. He maintained that the army cannot waver or slink away from such serious administrative failings if they were brought out into the light. Escalating the issue to the higher echelons of army command would force a response out of necessity. They would tolerate such conduct even less than the investigation could. What they needed to demand, Tachi maintained, was accountability. Kodera, on the other hand, pushed for an indirect roundabout approach. He argued that they would never get away what they needed or get what they needed from the army by operating under the impression that they were on even ground, because they clearly were not. I said they should go around the army in a sense. Direct the correct agency or organization towards existing the existing evidence of mismanagement, and secrets would come spilling out of their own accord. As each made the case, the chief deliberated over the two positions carefully before halting the debate with this decision. Hmm. Yeah, the army's pretty darn corrupt. I I gotta go with Kodera. Go beyond their backs. I don't know. I thought that sounds like something I'd do next uh, I would do already. Ah, uh, screw we'll go hold him a cannibal. I think it's all gonna end up in the same place, I think, in the end. So we're all gonna die in the end. Hospital, do we do prisons? Yes, do we do army bases? Manpower and organization is not bad. Not really super important for us right now though. Uh, admin offices are pretty good though. Let's get Kita. Admin offices. Because we want more political power. Yay! We want to need some more electricity too, eventually. Throwing the gauntlet. Tachi, emboldened by the chief's endorsement of his strategy, oversaw the subsequent correspondence personally. His chosen target and recipient of the investigation's eye was the Administration Bureau of the Army Ministry, the Imperial Army's resource of representation, and the Imperial Cabinet. Every request and form was subject to a scrutiny before being sent, and every official letter and written communication was borne, at least in part, from his pen. Through his efforts, Tachi wove an accusatory narrative aimed directly at the Ministry and their underlings. He alleged that the Imperial Japanese Army General Staff Office had allowed a culture of inadequate record handling to take root, not only in the departments of which the case was explicitly concerned, but the office's general correspondence with outside parties as a whole. He warned that not only was it a strong indictment of the general staff conduct, but also reflected poorly on them as well, as they were charged with the administrative aspects of Army's function. If they were to act or on or resolve this matter, they would only worsen that reflection. For the part, the Ministry did seem to take almost immediate notice of Tachi's handwork. Just Days after the first wave of correspondence, a sealed envelope addressed from the Army Ministry uh, Tokyo headquarters arrived at the station. Inside was a neatly typed and folded letter addressed to the chief of the department. They graciously thanked the investigation for bringing the issue to their attention and assured them they would investigate the situation with utmost haste. I'll believe it when I see it, though. Oh, look, our GDP is very close to getting the same number as our debt. 4.77 is not good enough, but I don't want to cut military austerity because that means less spending and means less uh, growth, probably, so... It is what it is. Read out. Read out of the joke. Unsurprisingly, waiting for a response to the Army Ministry devolved into an endless stream of unreturned calls, deflected questions, and deafening silence. However, just as Tachi's ceaseless, agitated pacing began to wear a trench into the floor of the station, a response came. It arrived. In the same manner that the first had, sealed envelope, neatly folded pages, and sharp ink characters, but the message that this one contained was very different from the agreeable tone of the first, so much so that Kodera characterized it as the nicest possible way to tell someone to F off and die. Sounds like what we tell people often. The ministry's reply, uh, after forcing its way through the obligatory pleasantries, first took the opportunity to clear themselves of any wrongdoing and write off any suggestions otherwise as hearsay. They maintained that the administrative mishaps and the investigation had experienced were side effects of previous logistical restructurings and changes in responsibility between the ministry and the general staff office. These processes have resulted in some known insufficiencies in the record systems, which had already been identified and accounted for. As the frustrating rate of turnaround or turn, uh, displayed by the various army offices, the ministry thoroughly expressed the importance of redundancy for the sake of security, and that such performance would fail within acceptable standards. Naturally, the Ministry's calm rebuttal sent the investigation team into a frenzy of activity. The lead detectives had no intention of taking the Ministry at the word and resolved to take further action. It was clear that the Army, that looking the Army Ministry in the face was not a viable option, but where to turn to next? Back down to the general staff or even higher up? Hmm. Right under their noses, and we get direct action, basically. Or, do we go over their heads? Um... Do we have clearance to go over their heads? I kind of want to go under their noses to see what happens, so... It sounds like we're just going to be digging stuff up anyways. Oh, I just want better depth. Because we're looking pretty good here overall. The 1963 Toho Tohoku winters. Tohoku had always been one of the hardest hit regions in Japan when it came to snow and winter. But this year, snowfall in the frigid northern region has hit harder than usual, and peculiar in particular. Aomori Prefecture has received record-breaking snowfalls exceeding 1,200 centimeters, with a depth exceeding 150 centimeters. 
All across Japan, individual charity initiatives through word of mouth, religious organizations, as well as political associations went on a charity offensive, calling for snowfall relief equipment and necessary a necessity donations. The prefectural government, for all intents and purposes, seems to be overwhelmed by the natural disaster that fallen upon Aomori. We received <clears throat> a barrage of phone calls and telegrams from the prefecture and the Ministry of Transport and Communications in charge of Japan's meteoric Meteorological research has been called upon the council by the prime minister. When the snowfall hits, standard excavation and recovery vehicles are used, tractors, snow plows, as well as civilian volunteers who dig through the snow with shovels. That's a standard operating procedure for the government, but the central government would take several days to mobilize the proper equipment for the task. Of note, however, is a proposal from Aomori's regional military commander. A call to mobilize the prefecture's reserve units and clear the snow with military hardware. But we should heavily consider the consequences of such a call. Maybe the boy's got the right idea. Maybe. Battened hatches. Or outbreak. I want to do an outbreak first. Following the flood of cases that Toilara Hospital received, a quick investigation was launched into the exact scale and impact of the apparently plague outbreak. Teams were sent into the countryside, hopeful that they would find uh, all to be mostly well and could report back to the issue that was practically already solved. This is not what they found instead. They found entire villages had come down the plague, and those that few that were not yet contaminated were attempting to isolate themselves and often tried to turn away the investigative teams for fear of infection, sometimes violently. It was not clear how far exactly the plague had spread on the island. What was clear though, was that when it had spread, it had spread quickly and completely, devastating local communities. This was much, much worse than they had initially feared. This could be bad. Oh, we can... Wait, what? Uh, okay, the investigation rushed to make contact with the lower-level administrators of the army, only for their efforts to blow up in their collective faces. The hastily <clears throat> assembled plan had been sketched out and put into motion less than a day after they received the ministry's response. The intention had been to make quiet contact with officials throughout the operations, intelligence, and communications divisions of the IJA General Staff Office. Once the contacts were made, the investigation would attempt to get a hold of the files related to the internal operations of the records rather than the records themselves, alongside testimonies from said officials. Once collected, that information could be compiled and compared to the statements made by the ministry to reveal any sources of, sources of inconsistency. However, it quickly became clear and apparent that the investigation's mistrust of the army ministry was mutual. Almost all the contacted officials either requested clearance of the team did not have or simply deferred to the ministry outright. All the few who did speak, they all either could not offer anything of use or could merely point to another uh, <clears throat> or uncooperative superior. The army's bureaucracy at all at once appeared to be tight, watertight, sealed in word, thought, and deed. But even in the face of this decisive setback, the pair of lead detectives remained firm. They argued both privately to the chief and to the team as a whole. That now was a time to double down on the strategy. Clearly, they claimed, the army was worried about what the investigation would find buried beneath all the papers. So worried, in fact, that they had rushed to clamp down on any potential points of entry. And where there was worry and frantic action, uh, there were bound to be mistakes. Keep up the pressure. And what the heck is about this whole Malagasy thing? Isn't it like Kirish or something like that? Is there any global conflicts going on? I have to wait for this thing to load up. Oh. Oh. In display. Ah, here it is. Civil War. No wonder. Ah, that makes much more sense now. Alright, so global conflicts. I don't want to spend too much political power here, so... Yeah, we'll definitely do that one. Uh, meeting with the generals. Give them equipment. We could. So which one do we like? Not this one. Oh, these, these guys got... Oh, power vacuum. What, the Jewish state? Where's the Jewish state? Partai de la Revolucion Malgach. We can send whole two divisions. I'm not going to send tanks and stuff like that into the mountains. There's no way I'm going to do that. So, Nishi, welcome back to the fun, fun, fun time, fun times. Yeah, fun times. How many plants can we send? A whole fat 80. Not a lot, but whatever. Here's 20. Actually, where's those planes that we sent down here too? Oh, um, we can send how many 80? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to send you guys hold. You know, I'm going to send you back to Japan so I know exactly where they're at. So there you go. But you go down to 50. There you go. You go right here. Have a good old time. And we need 30 more planes here too. Which is not bad. It's not even 63 yet. My goodness. Nice. Good job, guys. Still training, huh? Are you guys all done yet? or No, you're not. Oh my gosh. You guys stop for now. That'd be fine. And you guys... Ooh, got another carrier. That's pretty nice. Do you not have planes, though? Wow, that this carrier sucks. Holy crap. There you go. That's better. Hey, 
Everyone's at least one carrier, right? Oh, look at that lag. Oh, boy. The game's even paused and still lagging hard. Holy crap. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter there. You guys can go here. That's fine. All right. More Civil Wars. The third Civil War we're going to have in this episode. Which, this episode's lost quite a while, which is... No, no, no problem with me. I, I intended to do it like this because I knew there's going to be a ton of reading. Ton, 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 of reading. Expand lobbying. Hmm. There you go. Here, go on the offensive. Ring of the governors, in a misguided effort to preserve law and order. Some fairway governor general still refused to sign some crucial paperwork. A combination of honesty, gifts, and more direct means should convince them to do the right thing. So... Okay, just for freedom. So we do have. So with this, proposed by the conservatives, supports 234 out of 233 needed. So we should be okay. We got one more than we needed. Support 64% out of 50%. Keep white support, reformer support, conservative support, of course. Our faction, the conservatives, proposed a bill. Business units of the bill. Should it fail, our government's ability will be decreased by seven. Should it increase, we get two more. Oh. So we get this one passed. We get a bonus for our industry. Slightly worse regulations for pollution and workplace safety. And force faction unity. The power decreased by two and a half percent. Twelve more conservatives will support. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we have it only two, three, four. Out of, we should be able to get it done, right? Taking aim. The newest reorientation of the investigation uh, accompanied yet another shift in the mood and morale of the team. A sense of apprehension lingered in the air at the station. The same oppressive feeling one would get from reaching their hand into a dark hole in the ground. Just as easily as one could unearth some treasure or piece of lost knowledge, one could just as easily grasp onto the coils of some unseen terror. No one, from the bright-eyed rookie to the most scarred and tested veteran, could have anticipated finding themselves locked in a struggle against the leaders and representatives of the Imperial Army. There were reasons why the twin branches of the military were held above the petty realm of the Imperial politics. There were reasons why they maintained their own administrative channels for their own police forces, their own intelligence agencies. Their fears were their own. <coughs> their procedures their own. They're just us their own. And somewhere high within that bureaucratic behemoth sat the lofty conspirators of this bloody conspiracy. And now the detectives and officers of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department were going to bring them down. Onward and upward. We should be okay here. Um, I don't mind helping them out a little bit more if we need to. Okay, so these guys don't... Yeah, just stop training too. Even without the the main group taking stuff out, it still takes 2,900 a day, so... we got to make sure that we do well here too. Target priority. Ah, good. The decision to launch a full inquest against the Imperial Army came more debate. It was obvious at the moment the investigation made their motives clear. The administrative components of the army would launch a swift counter assault. In that case, the first blow had to be decisive. They would need hard evidence to justify the use of civil authorities against the military staff. Therefore, the point of argument between the detectives was where this blow should be placed to the most efficiency. Or to be most efficient. Godier argued that they should keep their efforts simple and targeted. Pull in the base commander associated with the killer and demand he open talk or talk openly, I would be faced with obstruction of justice charges. That way they keep the pressure in one place and potentially delay how fast the army can respond with little luck. They may even slide under the noses of the army admit admins entirely. Tachi disagreed, claiming that such an approach was too narrow in its scope. If they wanted to catch a conspiracy as a whole, they needed to cast it nets wider. Besides, all previous efforts to navigate the low-level bureaucracy had failed. It was time to meet the army ministry head on. He proposed they bring the demands for unrestricted access and uncensored testimony directly to their faces and in plain view. Then the army would have no choice but to comply or else risk appearing a suspect and corrupt before their administrative peers. Hmm. One person or everyone. Blow it up in front of everybody. I want to blow it up. I like blowing things up. Ooh, you know, I want to get this guy in place first before we do anything. A director. With the recent research into equipment tests and modernization, the government has asked the IJA to begin conducting tests on the new equipment devolved or developed in arms factories across the Empire. Quotas have to be fulfilled, and adaptations to the Type 120 flamethrower model were in the testing phase as new weapons were being developed for the IJA units across the sphere. However, now that the levels of snow are reaching extraordinary levels, the government had taken interest in using the weapons to combat the elements. A soldier from the local garrison in northern Japan had volunteered to test equipment under the supervision of scientific examiners from Tokyo, and he gallantly sprung into action to play with a destructive weapon. Half a dozen of his squad members cheered him on, while the scientists remained silent in anticipation of the weapon's successes against targets some distance away. A soldier rolled back his burdened shoulders and took a wide stance before bracing himself for a fiery inferno spewing out of his equipment. Ready when you are, soldier. Controversy in the cabinet. As expected, the investigation's demands for accountability from the Army Ministry were met with furious opposition, mostly from the office in question. It seems at the moment that the paperwork was placed in the hands of the workers at the Cabinet's general offices, a storm of controversy engulfed the whole forum. Of course, the mere implication that some subversive action had been carried out by the Army kicked off in an accompanying flurry of speculation, further straining the already tense situation. 
The representatives of the army ministry systematically alternated between unflinching defenses of the position and the fiery attacks on the motivations behind the demands. They claimed that the oversight of the internal military systems and operations of law enforcement were specifically designed to be separate from domestic civil authority and the intents or the interests of national security and administrative autonomy. In the next breath, they denied the legitimacy of the investigation's pursuits, claiming that they had to provide enough information to reach reasonable conclusions, and the continued efforts to subvert the established separation of authorities was tantamount to political tampering. The subtle in insinuation that all external oversight into the army was le le legitimate did not sit well with many of the Ministry of State. Some grumbling with concerns about precedents and procedures, but many others tacitly supported some of the key points given by the army, agreeing in principle with some concerns of practice, but the powerhouses of the Home Ministry and the Navy Ministry remained silent, forcing the cabinet into gridlock, leaving the pressure to build even further. We will weather the storm. We will. Hopefully we can win here. How strong is this group? Oh, a little bit of lag. Happy January. We finally got to 1963 after almost two hours of playing. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, look at that. Oh, they changed their office. United Coalition Government, huh? They got a lot of manpower. And all they have are Cobra missiles. Alright. Oh, please don't abandon... Oh, God. Please don't abandon your capital. Please, 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 please don't do that, you ding-dongs. And we're trying to help you out, but the solitary of soldiers. Solidarity. Eventually, after the days of debate in the cabinet assembly, a new perspective was offered to the floor. The Navy Ministry, which up until that point had remained mostly silent and seemingly withdrawn from the issue, put for the first statement since the whole affair began. But it as quickly made clear the statement did not come from the Ministry itself, in a sense, rather they were giving it on the request of the Navy General Staff Office. But the position put forth by what was thought to be the Army's first rival was almost unbelievable. The Staff Office justified the relevance of providing their opinion on the basis of the shared membership of the Supreme War Council with the Army Ministry, which they claimed played an essential military and political role. They initially re reiterated the Army's positions on the preservation of the independence of organizations and potential security ramifications, but afterwards made a much stronger claim. They maintained that the rights to exclusive authority over a legal investigation of military affairs rested solely with the internal system of the respective branch purely on the basis of military operational security. By this fact alone, they claimed none of, no other non-superordinate office of state could attempt to subvert the judgment of said systems without violating systematic independence. The investigation team was left baffled, none more so than the lead detectives. They had fully anticipated that all elements of the Navy would be taken at this opportunity to assert dominance over their bureaucratic rebel. Not stand by the side of all the times the Navy could have chosen to develop a sense of solidarity. Why now? A little suspicious, don't you think, and system failures. The click of the nozzle sounded over as the soldiers pulled the trigger, but the tanker on his back grumbled and did not spit out any of the blazes expected in the tests. Taken aback by the failures, scientists observing from a distance through their clipboards by the sides as they shot down their arms in frustration. Malfunction they concluded as reports that followed decided a defect in the adaptation of the Type 120 ignition system, a result of the cold weather's effects on the heated electrical wire within the weapon. Disappointed, the soldier disengaged his equipment and removed the tanker from his back. He dragged his feet upwards towards the squad members, and they welcomed him with a nodding acceptance, perhaps more disheartened. The scientific examiners leaned over the observing railings that peered over the testing fields at a loss for words. It was the experience, they thought, coping with the dread of reporting his system's failures back to the officers. Report a failure, but make, shout, make sure it sounds pretty. Hey, we won here. How's it going to lose the capital? The well is finished. The isolated gray machine with its black shell that coated the icy landscape stood alone at once. Stood alone. Yet it was eventually joined by a second. The construction did not go quite as planned this time. The foundations, thought to be firmly secured to the ground, gave way. The structure buckled under its own weight and tilted into the water before finally coming to a rest, lopsided and halfway in the icy water. Fortunately, the seemingly considerable setback could be resolved with the use of additional funds from the government. All would soon be restored to working order, apart from that which came at the loss of human life. Once the iron frame was properly attached and secured, the mechanisms could finally be welded into the proper places. After about a month of delays, the oil rig was finally finished, joining its twin in their much valued purpose. The icy waters of Carafuto seemed to grow darker as production ramped up. At the same time, the increase in oil production lifted the spirits of Sasakawa and the Prime Minister Hiroya Ino. Despite the setbacks, the additional funding had allowed for another rig to be built. Even more oil would be now be available for the government to utilize. Carafuto did eventually benefit from the oil wells. The money from the new industry helped to modernize both the once entirely agricultural economy and the sediments of Carafuto as well. Toyohara developed into a proper town with a matching port. Immigration rose significantly, as the oil attracted those who sought to find even more of the precious resource. While the oil fields grew and tarnished the landscape somewhat, the people of Carfuta Prefecture took solace in the precious comforts it had brought to them. A close call, but good enough in the end! Great! Awesome! Choosing a lead. 
But with lots details and various de leads of these cases growing ever longer and beginning to twist and intertwine with each other, the investigation was beginning to find its resources spread thin. Furthermore, the parallel investigation method that has served them so well the Star was now beginning to cause the various teams to stumble over each other on a more well known occasion, found themselves uncovering or detailing or dealing with redundant information. To that end, the two detectives had decided it was time to simplify the investigation process by pursuing one lead in particular. They figured that if the leads would overlap this much, then following just one to its end should lead to the resolution of them all. It just came down to choosing which was the best one to follow. Shipping, Ministry, IJ, and GSO. Shipping. Um, I don't remember which one we chose last time, so. I'm saying shipping, huh? I kind of want to do shipping. Obviously, we did with the army, military, the, the army stuff. The Navy is going to be pretty tight-lipped. I think I did that one last time, too. Ministry. I want to do shipping lead. Maybe I chose that one last time. I, I, I really don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't really remember it too much at all. It's been so long since I've actually played Japan. Oops. We don't want to do that one. We want to do something else like this one. Yeah. Better. <clears throat> Beat back those Americaners. But now the Mighty Adam. Every Tuesday, millions of boys and girls across Japan gather in front of TV sets in order to peer into another world. The world they glimpse through those hazy screens is a brighter one, where war is absent and wondrous technologies ease the burdens of mankind. One such technology is robotics, and one such robot is Adam. Mighty Atom is a creation of the master cartoonist Osamu Tezuka, who has been crafting comics starting the boy robot since 1952. Built to replace a scientist's dead son, Atom was discarded by his father and forced to survive on his own, but despite this cruel treatment and despite his artificial nature, Atom is defined by his kindness and his humanity. Though his heart beats with the awesome power of nuclear energy, he rarely resorts to violence. He lends aid to the distress and stands up to the wicked. Though the comic has been popular, the show, produced by Tenzuka himself, is the first animated TV series produced in Japan, and made it Atom known from Nagasaki to Hokkaido. At its height, Mighty Atom was watched by over 40% of Japanese households that own a TV. The whole ministry has even partnered with Tezuka to translate Mighty Atom for audiences across the sphere so that they can admire this new form of art, but it remains to be seen if the partnership will hold since the Mighty Atom is far from the triumphalist propaganda the ministry tends to produce. Though full of action and adventure, Atom's world is kinder one that, than her own, one worth striving for. The show is welcome respite from these trying times and shipping out. At this point, the majority of the evidence collected by the investigation ultimately pointed towards some form of international shipping. While such frequent references did draw the attention of the lead detectives, to a certain extent, it did make sense. Given the geographically fragmented nature of the Coast Prosperity Sphere, shipping became a foundational industry in of itself. Wherever an organization found some international commercial interest, private or imperial, the captains of the sea lanes were sure to follow. To that end, the shipping industry had taken on a sprawling character, with interests and offices in every field and in every nation and region in the sphere. In order to have any chance of finding useful information, the investigation would have to narrow their search to a particular area that they would likely to be relevant to the case. Why is the Navy moving the Army guns? Why is the Navy's role in moving the military yen? How are the Navy and conglomerate involved? I want to do the conglomerate, that one. I think I chose the top one last time. I could be wrong, but I still want to do it. Can you guys go in there? Yeah, you definitely can. Get the capital back. Uh, not bad. Where the shipping lanes cross. Since the start of the investigation proper, the tendrils of the Imperial military and the Mizaka conglomerate had spiraled around each other endlessly. Wherever one was concerned, the others always appeared in one way or another. At first, it is seen that the army was a primary participant in the collaboration between military and industrial parties. But as time went on, the Navy's influence was seen and felt in more and more places until it was obvious that there was a dominant party in the partnership. And as such, in the later stages of the investigation, <clears throat> Most of the efforts had gone to trying to find the point of overlap between the conglomerate and the Navy. Now, with the new information they had accumulated, the two organizations' mutual interest in international shipping may prove to be a good candidate for the point's location. In order to properly assess this possibility, the investigation would need to review two sources of information. First, was the forward-facing information that the Navy regarded the contracts with private industries, which they used as a subtle means to entice more competitive offers. Second, was the reports issued by Minazaka conglomerate itself, with a similar aim of enticing further investigation by demonstrating the political legitimacy. And besides, what businessman would pass up the opportunity to rub his military contracts in the faces of his rivals. Not one that I can think of. God, if we could go here and just circle these guys and kill them off, I would love it. Can you guys actually win here? Yeah, I didn't think so. And then, the first quarter report. The Ministry of Commerce and Industry will publish a paper that outlines the advancements and economic growth of the empire and the coast prosperity sphere in the last 10 years. The paper boldly states that the post-war is over, as Japan has now healed the wounds of the nations of Asia that had long suffered under Western colonialism and oppression. From here, Japan and with it, Asia will enter a new age of prosperity and harmony. Yes, totally. <clears throat> the glory of the sphere. We've finally done it. Japan has dredged up the four uh, faltering nations under the boot of the West and lifted them up through economic growth and great prosperity. Standards of living are at an all-time high, and technology continues to push forward without relenting. While the two other thirds of the world are crawling in the mud and suffering, Japan has created an economic system to the last ages and bring bounty. Tenno Haika Banzai. 
Dai Nihon Taikoku Banzai. Dai To Kaiokan Banzai. Nice. Bell passes in the die. Whether through luck or efficient planning, the bell, our bell has managed to make it through the institutions of power. Now can question our effectiveness as the legitimate governors of Japan, and our government's reputation has been boosted. On to the next one. Some other dot reassess our support for government. We must continue to match our relations with other factions. Nice. Growing ever fonder. Ooh, cordial. Key to white. Uh, reformist. Terrible technocrats. Huh? Accent with the conservatives. Uh, key to white, maybe? Good? I don't know. We'll see what happens. I don't know sure which way we're going to go, so... As expected, the public-facing reports of the Minazaka conglomerate and administrative elements of the Navy provided some insight to the relationship. Over the course of the past ten years or so, the Navy had signed a number of contracts with the conglomerate of varying natures. The initial ones were ostensibly simple purchases, including things from food rations to industrial ma maintenance supplies. The only thing slightly unusual was that the contracts indicated that the Navy would be responsible for nearly all aspects of shipping related to these agreements without any indication of a corresponding price adjustment. The more recent contracts involved much more complex and long-term agreements. This included things from multi-year perpetual uh, purchasing commitments to usage of certain facilities by other parties. Even more surprising was that on a few occasions the conglomerate had to sign a contract with a third-party organization, but the Navy still agreed to ship their wares for them at a comparatively competitive rate, even though they had no obvious vested interest. Of course, these dealings were less proudly displayed by the two organizations, and most information about them came from obscure areas of public record. For the perspective of the two lead detectives, they had two visible or uh, viable angles of investigation. One option was to go after the shipping records associated with the contracts to ensure that the real deals match up with the Piper agreements, or otherwise they could use these contracts as a rough guide to estimating the Minazaka conglomerate's international profits and assets. I don't do shipping records. Uh, profits, though. Let's go with profits. Because records, I mean, they they will be fudged a little bit, but still. If we go down here, we could kill these guys off, too. Ooh, that's not a bad idea, actually. How fast are you? Four, oh, that's not bad. 4.4 is really not bad at all. They got a lot of buffs here. You have to send this division over, because it's so good. There are no transport helicopters, but they're still not bad at all. All right. Offensive area. Get down here, cut these guys off, and the currency. A closer look at the Navy's involvement in the intrasphere industrial shipping revealed a number of trends. First and foremost, was the persistent contact between them and the Minazaka conglomerate. Though the Department of Navy Ministry did make deals and collaborate with many of the companies and conglomerates with Japan, none were so specifically and consistently tied to shipping. This was further amplified by another trend, the recurring usage of the military yen and payment of these industrial contracts, most consistently in the fulfillment of contracts with the Minazaka conglomerate, to be precise. This had not been immediately apparent to the investigation. It was first noticed by the detective Tachi when he had difficulty tracking down the associated payments in the Navy's public budget records. After further scrutiny, he found that the records were part of the military yen departments, as the transaction files were always stored with these associated, with those associated, with the currency they were still fulfilled with. But this begs the obvious question as to why the Minazaka conglomerate would never accept such a form of payment, let alone request it. From all outside perspective, the military yen was a derelict currency, poorly administered and of questionable value outside the specific geographic regions. What value could such a currency hold to a powerful financial group and one of the strongest nations on the earth? There has to be more to it. There has to be. I'll do them too, because we can. The emergency audit. Without the benefit of one central office or authority to look towards in order to gather information about the financials of the naval industrial shipping scheme, detectives Tachi and Kodaro were forced to do it by hand in a way. They would have had to start by selecting a peculiar or particular contract between the Navy and an industrial conglomerate, Yuji Minazaka, and making note of its agreed payment and signed date. Then the detectives had to corroborate this information with two additional sources. First, was the expenditures of the Navy, which was fairly easy to track given its semi-public nature. Second, was the finances of the Minazaka conglomerate, which had to be derived from the organization's profit reports and traceable tax records and forms. And finally, after hours upon hours of intellectually painful process of comparing, recording, and recomparing financial, various financial figures, they made a breakthrough. The financial records of the two groups, the Navy and the conglomerate, simply did not match up. The profit reports posted by the Minazaka from fulfillment to con contracts totaled much higher than they should have been based on the contract reports. And oftentimes, the real amount of yen spent by the Navy was much less than the amount they should have. It was obvious that some form of financial tampering was occurring, likely with the assistance of the military yen. But without coherent records, it would be impossible to locate, let alone prove there was only one drastic action that might get them access to the evidence they needed. An unannounced wave of, of imperial audits. Now we're bringing out the big guns, and things are totally not going to collapse here. We're just waiting for these guys to die, too. You guys are looking good. We can go up to 80 still. Darn it, I want more. Hey, look at that air speed. 
along the audit. While the cover of a general administrative audit would provide the investigation some leeway in conducting their searches, there were still some challenges given the degree to which the area of shipping they were concerned with was so fundamentally tied with the Navy, they said likely would be subjected to some sort of pushback and bureaucratic obfusc obfuscation that they received from the military branches prior to this. This was further complicated by the fact that the Navy's shipping scheme existed in a gray area outside normal administrative authority. Rather than being directly created and maintained by a single office, the desired effect of the program was produced by the coordinated initiatives carried out by a group of naval and financial organizations. And while an administrative audit may be a powerful tool, it was not only a free pass to all areas of the Empire. If they wanted to be effective, they would have to be, first be very selective. To that end, they were presented with the choice of, or of orientation to start their audit with. They could focus their efforts on the colonial ports spread throughout the co-prosperity sphere and attempt to take advantage of any regional autonomy that existed, or they could eschew the subtlety and directly hit the departments of the Navy, directly responsible for managing the part of the shipping program. Shipping departments. Um, the Navy shipping departments, hmm. Eschew the subtlety. Hmm. We need to be selected with the sphere ports. Or shipping departments. Hmm. Suddenly and directly hit the departments of the Navy. Um. I'll go, uh, we were to try to direct the intervention earlier and they didn't give us too much. Ports. I'm going to port it up. Port it up, port it up, port it up, port it up. Port it up. First quarter report. Probably still getting better here. You know, the research is still getting worse. But hey, look, less than 100% debt to GDP ratio. I just don't know how hard we're going to get hit. So, at 3.5% real growth, nothing bad could ever happen. But the best motivator, fortunately, for the investigation, the regional port authorities lived in perpetual fear of the support superordinates on the Japanese mainland. So, when the two detectives from the top level investigative unit based out of Tokyo reached out to them, most complied without too much effort out of our a fear of reapproachment from the superiors or for non-cooperation with the investigation, not realizing it was their superiors themselves who were under investiga investigation in many cases, as suspected. The foreign ports that had fallen under direct Japanese administration, specifically through the Navy in more recent times, were jumbles of military and civil uh, bureaucracy. There was, no, there was a two-way effect from this. Most obvious of that with the presence of military equipment came heightened security, which was so also partially applied to non-military products that passed through the ports. But in the reverse direction, some of the standard organizational methods and transport route teams, routines associated with the profit-driven efficiency of private industry had bled in the Navy's conduct towards the military equipment. While this jumble was certainly confusing and proved difficult to sparse, the sheer presence of the confusion was somewhat indicative of in, of in itself. The Navy's interests had clearly become deeply intertwined with those of the private industry on a very practical material level, not just in rhetoric and disposition, as had been previously suspected. And of course, whatever or wherever military and commercial interests met, there was always prime ground for corruption. I prefer respected, but I'll settle for feared. Ooh, if they're attacking here, that's not good. Uh, could we actually break out through here, maybe? Move fast enough? Could you actually attack here too, maybe? No, you couldn't. Because I just don't want to lose and get encircled here, so that's what we're going to move out here. Take another airport. Ooh. Ooh, we're about to get encircled here. Man, this to the method, of course. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. How does it turn out? The jumble of a civilian and military bureaucracy within the sphere of ports caused a sense of confusion that permeated far deeper into... <clears throat> uh, the organizations that appeared at first glance. The two lead detectives and their team suggested, or struggled, to make sense of the records they were provided. It was not the case that they were ineligible or impossible to sparse. It was more that it was impossible to assemble any sense of consistency or derive any pattern from the sum of its total records. This was doubly concerning given the nature of the organization that stood above it. The Imperial Navy, while renowned for its power and influence, was not known to a particularly nimble organization. They were slow to implement a policy and slower to modify it. They typically made long-term expansive deals with strict contracts, always careful to avoid surrendering too much ground or providing too much interpretive leeway. But the patterns of shipment and movement of both civil and military wares do not remotely resemble an organization of that character. The quantities and types of equipment being moved and shifted on a bi-monthly or even weekly basis. Uh, military equipment was that originally bound for one location was later redirected to somewhere else. Ships that traveled along fairly regular routes never carried a consistent amount of wares to the locations. Some officers observed that these fluctuations did somewhat align with those in the corresponding product markets, but in order for the Navy to take advantage of such information, they would require facilities and departments committed to analyzing the relevant statistics and produce the reports far beyond the capabilities of the existing departments. And surely the industrial conglomerates would not surrender the information they used to produce their profit margins. Surely, right? We want to kill this division off if we possibly can first before they... Yep, good, 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 good. And I'm not going to go in there because that division's already dead. This is good. It's very good. We should be able to win here too. Anything else here? No? Good. 
98.7, nice. And still going up. Blast. If it hadn't been for the Detective Cordero's time in the Navy, the investigation might have passed over the glittering evidence that was situated in the tangled mess of military industrial shipping collusion. Throughout the initial foray, the investigation had made two key observations. First and foremost, generally, the shipping systems the various organizations had conspired were to create to create were inconsistent in the conduct and scheduling, resembling market movements more than the prep project of a militarized bureaucracy. Second, and more subtle, was the existence of a single unnamed ship which consistently traveled to an obscure military installation near the Korean Manchurian border. It was in the records of the ship that the Kodira first noticed the evidence of a fraud, but after recognizing its implications, he soon began to check all the other records for similar evidence, which should be found in abundance. What gave it away in the end was a ballast. When a cargo ship needed to load or unload substantial amounts of cargo, they would need to make a corresponding ballast adjustment to keep the ship level and its center of gravity low. This was generally done by flooding des desiated ballast chambers in the ship within seawater. But in the case of the Navy shipping, on many, many occasions, the ballast adjustment did not match the weight of the cargo they said they were offloading and onloading. Generally, the ballast adjustment was far greater than what should have been necessary for the amount of cargo they said to be carrying, implying that they were actually hauling more than they claimed. But what was even more alarming was that this occurred on a number of occasions with ships carrying military equipment. Well, crap. Oh, General Poggy disappears? Well, goodbye, General Poggy. Poggy Poggy. Oh, look at it. Oh! Nice. Good job, guys. Oh, back to the front lines. Maritime reviews. Can we actually get more place here? Guiding, we can. Normally, or nominally, the influence that the Imperial Navy has in our politics is enough to keep us from keeping too close an eye on them and their affairs, but the issue's gone on long enough. With enough support and evidence on our side, we now have secured a warrant to review the cargo manifests. We can now expect what exactly the Army's been receiving. There are, of course, a couple of options as how we can secure the information we need. Either we can take the safe route and check the warehouse records and make some inter inferences here and there, or we can check a direct, albeit rescue, alternative, where we directly seize a boat, running the questionable delivery route and interrogate the crew. Stop the ship. Hmm. Records. Records, records, records. Oh, where are we at now? A little bit of lag, but whatever. And, uh, yes, so good. So much better. So much better. Oh, my goodness. Lots of surplus. And this actually gives us more political power? No. Oh, su our surplus does not give us any more growth, which does suck, but warehouse blues. Tachi is not a terribly taciturn, taciturn public person in public, but the warehouse shocks even him to, into silence. The nondescript building is staffed by what would appear to be a completely normal bunch of workers of assorted nationality, and the cargo is visibly per uh, visible. The warehouse functions like a perfectly normal warehouse, just like every other one in the sphere. The pro only problem is, well, the paperwork, of which there is none. Oh boy. Um, the record of the ships is which its services are clean. The offices to which Cordera is redirected turns out to be more an excuse or ex exercise in imagination than actual corporate structure. The tidal wave of files, folders, and binders which slowly drowns all Japanese officers is simply not present, not in this case. Tachi is stumped. Cordera is horrified. The team is shocked and is silence. Nevertheless, <clears throat> never in all their years... They have seen such an affront against the ethos of the Japanese company. More importantly, without the accompanying documents as physical, physical proof, nothing can be said about the nature of the cargo. But after a 20-hour combing of the warehouse, during which several team members collapse, a series of unmarked boxes is found, even without the most basic of identifying marks, invoices or receipts on their body. The way has obvious, if only because there is no other. We'll trace those darn boxes. Ah, the Reich is here too. Interesting. If you could, come down here too. We're struggling down here quite a bit, so... And this guy's learning quite a bit, too, which is awesome, awesome, awesome. Keep learning, keep learning. When in doubt, keep learning. The trail of goods. The boxes upon examination, and after a prolonged, occasionally physical struggle with the workers handling them, revealed little. The goods within appear to be a perfectly normal military surplus, totally in line with the IJA guidelines for shipping supplies. When traced, an examination of random selection leads to a mess of origins from the army storehouses around the sphere. So confusing, Kodera and Tachi agree not to follow it. The week-long silence from a frustrated army logistics command did not help matters either. In fact, the spread of the surplus goods leads this to a so messy web of transactions that it looks like a cover-up. Most boxes of goods will come from a common network linked by maritime routine or route or geographically proximity. The web of goods of this box does not. It is all perfectly random. No rhyme or reason. Sure, evidence of tampering. But the random nature of the goods is also very much anonymous. And then it hits them. The content of the boxes is totally random. But the box itself is not. All the boxes have the same packaging, and the IJA uses local packaging for shipping requirements. A common source in an army warehouse not too far from the warehouse itself. The team readies its gear. Paperwork is made in huge gluts. This could be a big score. We must brace ourselves. And brace ourselves, we will. Nice. Alright, so now, once these tank leads, I'm going to go... Yeah, maybe we'll take them. The warehouse, though. Maybe not. Tachi and Kodera finally found themselves at the entrance to the warehouse. It had been quite the journey to get here, and Cordero comments that it would likely not be worth a while. Just another dead end, or another tiny chain in the endless link. 
statue remains silent and approaches the door, only to be stopped by a warehouse worker. He tells them that they are not authorized to enter and that they would be best off leaving. Tachi flashes his credentials, but the worker does not budge, annoyed. Tachi goes on a long rant until the worker finally gives in nervously and allows the two detectives to pass inside. The two are initially rather curious, then confused and then completely shocked. The warehouse is completely empty. Oh boy. The two detectives w both walk around for a moment in a stunned silence, looking for anything at all. Weapons, supplies, the kinds of things that they had been tracking to find in this place. They find not a single box of shells in the entire building. They immediately begin a a pulling aside and questioning the true minute skeleton crew, who dodge every question and refuse to give a straight answer to even the most basic queries. Kodera eventually demands to see the actual documents and records, but is still denied. Tachi goes to investigate the office anyways, but finds nothing. Even after prying open locked cabinets, he finds no records and no real documentation at all. Kodera and Tachi eventually gather what they can to prepare to head back. They found so much more and, more and so much less than they hoped at the same time. Oh my goodness, the riches continue. Now that we've solved our economic problems, we can focus on more pressing matters such as the military or social policy. The system we built has a tremendous, a troublesome foundation, but that shouldn't concern us for now. It will take years until the cracks start to show, and by then we'll be in a much better position to work on the underlying issues. Until then, we can lie back and enjoy the splendid results of our little Kai Koka 2. Kai Koka. Hmm. Oh, the Reich. Never change. Keep holding on, Marines. You're doing a great job. We're getting more army speed, too, which is great. Paralyzed. Tachi and Kodera eventually return with what they have found, plunging the entire investigation team into a complete and utter shock. This has just become much bigger than they ever really wanted, and they have crossed the regular threshold of risk to a point where their safety may be compromised. They're clearly very important and high-ranking people with who would be willing to take very drastic measures to keep this quiet, whatever this reality was, or really was. The debate soon proves to be extremely divisive. Many become extremely worried about whether they might be in too deep and if it might just be best to drop the whole thing. Others insist that the only way to ensure their own safety is to continue pressing harder. Every moment they, that, they, that this loose and end stays untied, they become more at risk of retaliation from those who are being investigated. The only sure way to be both safe and make sure that the justice is served is to strike first. The debate carries on for hours as investigators pour over all information, reading and rereading every line, combing over everything they have gathered as of yet to try and glean some coup cue as to what they must do next. Eventually, however, one conclusion is reached. Something has to be done. This case cannot go cold. The only thing is to figure out what exactly to do. We're trading in very dangerous territory, and that's the way we like it. That guy's every time I see him has just a massive forehead. Just the juggernaut of foreheads. Man, that rock is really trying to kill us off, is it aren't they? The Blood Camellia Lady. The orchestral opening brought a somber mood to the audience in the bar, even for those who were already extremely drunk. Mijia faced the audience, and he feared leaving her as she began to sing. Endless nights in pain, with a heart torn apart, none know how many tears the Camellia Lady cried. Tears formed in many eyes as Mijia retold the story of Camellia Lady. A standing ovation, Hijia was next, straightening her shining dress. She took the microphone from the attendant and made the a customary bow. Rising from it, the music played from the speaker again, an upbeat, upbeat tune played, giving the audience a jolt of energy. Haija began to sing the audience claps to the tomb, or clap to the tomb. Please tell me you like me and I can't get by without you. The audience danced to the song, some singing, others smiling, the lyrics of youthful love having touched their hearts. The crowd gave Haija a standing ovation as before. Smiling at the reception, Haija returned to the table, and the rest of the musicians were seemingly deep in the conversation. Haija C, do you want to go to Manchuria? A woman dressed in red approached Haija from the table. Mija. Manchuria. Haija's expression soured. Why would I want to die in that crap hole? It's not about working in the factories, trust me. None of us want to do that. It's about performing somewhere else, somewhere better for us. Mija's words rang true. She barely scraped by, scraped by in Japan. And the homeland was much better. When do you plan on leaving? When do we have enough money? Too crazy to work? After hours of in debate and scheming, Ta Tachi finally speaks up with a truly insane idea. That is clearly much deeper than anticipated. The military is somehow involved. And they do not act soon. They could be in the sights of some very powerful and very dangerous people, thus. The only course of action was to strike fast and more importantly strike hard. If the suspects will not cooperate, which they have shown they will have no plans to do so, then the investigators will have to get the smoking gun themselves. A vulnerable military base, one assigned to the unit which the warehouse is supposed to belong to. A quick raid in and out, and the criminals exposed before they can do so much as file a complaint. Kodera listens thoughtfully, and though many are wary of the plan, he speaks in favor of it at the end. He talks about the context he has made over the years, people who could get the men and supplies necessary for such an ambitious operation. People who have dealt with the unsavory and dangerous things before, Kodera is, after all, one of the most seasoned members of the team. Tachi thinks Kodera, but insists that he knows his own plan and the people he wants to carry it out. He's young, fresh, and the wild card. He, the people he might know are stranger, more on the fringe, and perhaps more unique and more unexpected to both the team and to their foes. His ideas are innovative, but untested. The team is weary, but many think his tenacity will bring them to victory. Eventually, he's brought. Find his allies. Uh, I think I chose Kodera last time. Let's go with Tachi. Tachi. Tachi? Tachai? Something like that? Other uh, tanks tremble. They don't do their worst. Because we're still doing well here. The young wolf. 
The young transfer from Osaka, Detective Tachi, would lead the charge to find the initial allies against the Navy or Army. A bold first idea is to simply ask the Navy to help the Tokyo police fight the Navy. Hidden in the maze of audits and circumstantial evidence was the simple fact that there does not seem to be enough money to go around. There have been winners in the Navy, shipping sector. There have been losers. By seeking the help of greedy Navy men that have been left out of the lucrative Army-Navy contracts, the police department could begin building a coalition. Once the raid came to public attention, perhaps enough of this ambitious Navy men would try to sell out their own Navy rivals to defend the police's efforts. And if the Army was trying to get it well, Tachi hoped that the Navy men not in bed with the Army would jump at the chance to upstage their land rivals. Of course, a safer option was to find more reliable police officers. Tachi had a lot of friends in Osaka and Kobe police departments. Some of West Japan's police higher-ups might be able to swing po local politicians away of the Tokyo's police investigation, of course. The Army and Navy's ex reach extended all over the fine... All over the home islands, but Detective Tachi was ready to bet that this particular conspiracy wouldn't leave the Army Navy barracks of Tokyo. Couple of Russian policemen? Let's have tea with the Navy officers. A uh, smell of independence. The Malayan insurrection had been quashed, and a new leader of the country, while acceptable, wasn't quite who we would have wanted. The new elected Prime Minister, and the first one since the end of the insurrection, is now Borhanuddin al Hamimi, a Malayan nationalist and an Islamist. Al Hamimi desires to build rebuild Malaya according to his vision, an Islamist anti-colonialist Malaya to walking hand in hand with its Asian partners. However, he's been found to be slightly too friendly towards Indonesia, to our liking, and along with being too radical and not submissive enough. His desire for independent Malaya is well known and is unfortunately resonating within the Malayan people. Oh, moreover, his conciliatory and am amiable even a stance towards Indonesia may upset the balance of the Kofra Spirit sphere a bit too much by empowering Sukarno's regime at the cost of our influence in the region. Nevertheless, the Prime Minister is still relatively collaborative, which means that the situation is stable enough for the time being, and in any case, we unfortunately cannot do much at the moment, which means that our too radical collaborator will have to stay in his position for now. Hopefully it won't cause too much trouble. That would be quite unfortunate. Can I actually go here? Nice. Go in here immediately. Nice. Good stuff. Just don't lose here too much. Even if we do lose here, I'm not too concerned about it. Navy robbery. A pleasant tea ceremony in Ueno Park. Detective Tachi admired that finely lacquered bowl as he and his host did Host chatted pleasantly. Soon the topic came to the difficulty to find purpose now that the Japanese Navy was the strongest in the world. No, the young detective had heard, never heard of such dreadful things as Navy officers, whoring out the proud Japanese Navy as commercial freighter. But now that the honorable officer had mentioned it, the young detective had been investigating untidiness among the ranks of the Navy and Army. Were trouble to arrive, it warned the, warmed the young detective's heart to know that proud men still toiled to maintain the Navy's honor and reputation. The Navy officer nodded to this and pledged to support the Tokyo Police Department in its endeavor to root out corruption. So went several of the Detective Tachi's afternoon for the week. Not every Navy man was as delicate and diplomatic as a tea ceremony enthusiast. Many simply wanted a slice of the pie when potential rivals were canned. The young detective never explicitly discussed the Navy or Army Navy underground shipping contracts, but his interlocutors seemed heartened to know that the upper rungs of the Navy were expected to be hit by the police quite soon. In return, these ambitious men would protect the police from any backlash. Time to go see your bosses. Anything else here? No? Good. Briefing on the Korean situation. Reports from our administration on the Korean Peninsula have described a recent surge in secessionist terror attacks. Police precincts and military garrisons have been hit hard, particularly. Frustrating the process of importing supplies from the home islands, unfortunately, all these responsible parties have been detained and are likely to be given the death penalty. During questioning, the terrorists would not give the names of any responsible or possible benefactors they have, but later raids on associated addresses reveal large caches of American-made munitions and weaponry. The Korean branch of the Camp Baitai will be investigating the issue further. Korea is Japanese, and it will continue to be, whether Koreans like it or not. Morandava? Morandava. Go up. Tachi and Kodera looked at each other grimly before they entered the office of their boss. They had worked hard to ensure that they had the proper allies and contacts made this operation a reality, spending a days spending days finding the best man for the job, but they had to admit the idea was still rather risky. As soon as they explained the planned raid, the boss was immediately began tearing into it. He was extremely skeptical that it could work at all, and worried about how terrible the repercussions could be if it didn't fail. He was a man who played the rules and by the rules, and the rules were not terribly well defined here. The discussion will hear I was on the brink of becoming a full-blown argument, but through deft teamwork and excellent planning, Kodera and Tachi were able to hold their ground without pushing too hard. They explained every aspect of the plan and knew how it would be executed, and any concerns their boss might have were quickly eased. It was not short or easy, but after a long session, their boss was finally convinced the raid would happen. There was only one catch, though. The boss was not convinced that the team had all the people needed to properly carry out the raid with the needed precision and ambition. He ordered the two detectives to gather more allies, people with real power and experience. He suggested less savory organizations that felt cheated by the competition from the government, or politicians who could use their cult to support the investigators and hurt their rivals. If Tachi and Kodera could get the necessary help, then the raid would happen. Allies in politics are safer bet? You need a criminal catch a criminal? Um, I don't know which way I did last time, but let's do criminal. I like criminal. Sounds more fun that way. 
Uh, conflict status. Look at that. 97.7%. Just beautiful. And it keeps going up. Uh, underground context. Katachi and Kodera quickly debated which of the paths they would follow, but only after a moment. Kodera came out on top and said he had the number of certain Yakuza family that could be of assistance. Tachi was skeptical but gave in. Kodera went off and started to make some calls. He could only hope that this would end well, even as the most civilized of the Yakuza. Gangs were not particularly notorious for being friendly. After making a quick call, he headed off into the city to meet with the, main, the man he contacted. Kodera ducked under an archway into the little restaurant. There he saw the old man, one that I've worked with before. A Yakuza boss, not a particularly noteworthy one, but one, uh, the only one... Caldera could even think of working with. They exchanged the standard pleasantries and spoke largely in veiled sentences, but the negotiations were productive. The boss was angry at the competition to his business opposed by the very government, and he was very willing to work with Caldera and the team to take them down. They ended the meeting with a handshake and both left with a new ally. Take any friend you can get, and a sweet goodbye. Mr. Kim had difficulty most days controlling his students. Tell me about it. The schools in Incheon were not well funded, especially for Koreans. Not only were the administrators putting extra pressure to emphasize Japanese cultural education, but any classes beyond conceptual were for the most part non-existent. It pained the teacher to watch his brightest students spend his time or spend his class in boredom, craving a more rigorous curriculum. Perhaps he felt they needed a more inspiring class, yet the, yes, their final chemistry course would be a lesson in creation of dragon's beard candy. All throughout the week, Mr. Kim practiced the recipe in his home, consulting with a retired confectioner in town, laboring human at what? humid weather. Once he felt he had acquired a solid grasp, Mr. Kim went out and drew money from the savings, enough to make sure every student could make their own and then some. It would be very unprofessional, but at least the kids would enjoy it. These people lacked the patience he had for the candy to turn into the wispy strings that the master could to make. But the joy in their eyes for a real experiment would never fade from Mr. Kim's memory. They had the chance today not just to recite and memorize what the Japanese administrators felt was best, but to create something truly Korean. A taste of freedom is the best meal of all. Kill them off and move to the air? Might as well. Might as well try, at least. Trotting in the air. Solo turned the radio up, letting the soft musings of the violin, the plucking of the guitar, and the whispers of the accordion guide her to sleep. Beams of light shone through the window, giving the warmth. She knew the song well. It was a street of dawn, sang by Toyota Nadeshiko. See, she let her eyes droop as Toyota began to sing throughout the speakers, technically. It was illegal to be listening to this Korean... Uh, to listening to this, Korean wasn't allowed on the radio, but somehow something attracted her to the music. Her friend Kata had let her borrow some of the records, and she soon fell in love. The puzzle music stopped suddenly, replaced by yelling, ripping Sato out of her sleep before it could even start. Let's go! What the f are you doing? A voice from what could only be presumed was a radio personality grunted out. A second later, a loud throw was heard. Sato blinked, simultaneously unsurprised and somewhat surprised that this has happened. She rubbed her temples. Now she had to find another station that played her music, and there were probably more arrests happening as she sat there. What if the Toko knew that she listened to such music? What to do? What to do? He turned into another station and lied down to the couch to catch a thief. The investigation team had gathered a cabal of uneasy friends and allies. The planning is in its final stages. The planners determined that a fast and clean raid is both possible and extremely desirable. A single drop of bloodshed by either side could spell a catastrophe. The last thing anyone wants is conflict among loyal servants of the Empire. Thus, the operation must be planned down to the millisecond. Every map stepped out. Every step mapped out. Every factor brought into the equation. There remains, however, one titanic decision to raid the army or to raid the navy. It seems that for the particular unsavory endeavor, the two have put aside their differences for mutual gain, but their general separation and traditional rivalry means that only one can be focused on. The team is divided onto who plays a large role and who's a riper target, but eventually a decision has to be made. Army? Navy. I want to go with navy. We have to go with navy. Can you go in here, maybe? Come on. Oh! Hold first. Hold, hold, hold. The Navy HQ. It seemed like the obvious choice, as Tachi saw no point in moving away from the path of least resistance. After closed door debate with Kodera and a search for a bugs and surveillance equipment immediately before said debate, the Navy was deemed as a branch of the armed forces more reliable for investigation. Kodera laid out his old arguments. The Navy wasn't the owner of the goods in the first place, and as a shipment movement, they simply couldn't prove details as to the whereabouts of the missing equipment. Tachi pointed out that the Navy might not have details on it, but the hundred little sub-companies hitched onto its back had more than sufficient details on the matter to justify raid. And where the Navy ended and these sub-companies began was anyone's guess, the cash flows of these companies surely critical to the analysis of the Navy would be also invaluable and should therefore be captured sooner. In any case, the Navy's involvement with the investigation had become so deep-rooted that it would almost uh, be a relief to move from the subtle passive-aggressive dances of bureaucratic handwriting or hand-wringing to outright antagonism. On this day, Kodira was silent. He had been on the receiving end of too many ch ch chidings from the Navy Ministry to disagree. The debate was settled. The gears of the team began to move. Let's let us go to proceedings then. Can you just capitulate when you take that tile? Yeah, I might just be able to. The Red Island under the rising banners. We did. Madagascar with a light with celebration amongst the burned and sh shattered ruins left behind the war for freedom. 
Even as remnants of their foes took refuge in the remote countryside or fled across the sea, cinders and vil uh, villages struggled to rebuild, and weary men returned from the war to cities under repair. The people were happy and free. The plaza of the center of the capital is no exception. A festival had taken overtaken the square, and people rejoiced there, despite much of the city's historic skyline being broken up by buildings that still bore the scars of war. A group of Japanese officials, military and government, and businessmen alike gathered in a building overlooking the festivities. Backs lit up by the city's joyous lights filtering in through the window into the dim room wherein they discussed what to do next. As his colleagues spoke, a general assembly uh, or a general absentmindedly swirled his drink in his glass, looking down at the excited and thankful masses. Japanese flags were about as common as the Madagascar ones, and he couldn't help but roll in the praise. One of the politicians startled him. I don't like this, he said, approaching his side as the gaze shifted down towards the crowd. The general glanced over the raised eyebrow. What, what do you mean? We've won. Look at them. They love us. They celebrate their freedom, he said, struggling to conceal the slur in his voice. That's the issue. Have you been listening? They've been speaking with their colleagues about the new government they've arranged. It does not align with their interests. Darn shame. I doubt to survive on their own. I think you misunderstood why I brought this up. We need to make sure that they align with us, and that they may take some spread measures. For the sake of their sovereignty, of course. Of course. Nice. Very good. Finding a branch. In the end, there was a paperwork that the, did the Yokosuka Naval Logistics and Supply Base in. That was its formal name, anyways. Most just called it Yokosuka. It had been relatively undeveloped following the war, with official funds flowing from centers to connected with the arteries of the sphere, places like Shonan and Jakarta. Although funds had dried up, other sources of revenue and supplies had replaced them, very interesting sources. And the amount of paperwork done to justify this diversification, even more interesting. In fact, most of the interesting part of this was that the paperwork itself appeared to fit a base larger than the Yokosaka base. Analyses created an image of a sprawling center of military activity, with complex logistics and supply chains. This activity was totally absent from the payrolls, the records at Central HQ, and the public eye, but it was there. The question was, to what end? Subsidiary factors only proved the uh, suitability of the base. The unguarded paperwork trail that had attracted the team to the base meant that the base was run by management either blinded by the, the greed or brainless in their actions, not that the Navy men couldn't be both. To ensure that the smoothest possible cor course of entry, the team spent a week creating a foot foolproof alibi. They became members of the local branch of the Kotachi uh, United Shipping Supplies, a company run from far away Sapporo by the Kotachi brothers, Navy veterans with an impeccable record. This record was also entirely fictional, but who noticed? It was a word of sh world of shadows, and the team knew the best plans always came to fruition in the dark. Sources were traced, money changed hands, meetings were arranged, the game was on. Let us lay the traps. Good job, Gabriel. Good job. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, my friends. Not a big enough sphere, that's all I'm going to say. We know national focus either. 97.2, not bad. 254, 261, money talks. Oh my god. Godera had spent a week long, boring over the necessary documents. His eyes were aching and his 5 o'clock shadows beginning to relapse into his full-grown neckbeard. But he had, alas, a picture of the single most glaring issue of the cash flows of the Yokosuka, Yokosaka base. It stood out as a series of glaring red figures, a sea and a paper full of puddles. Whoever was handling this issue was even worse at covering his tracks in the rest of the base, which is certainly saying something. It even had a name attached to it, the Internal Logistics Department. How quaint and ironic, in any case. The department head was likely to be foolish enough to accept something at face value, and in a friendship established meeting held in a secluded bar, Caldera began offering mountains of somethings. He hinted at the riches his company had to offer, its links to the lucrative Hawaii pineapple trade route, and the pos positive consequences of cooperation, and applied airily that if certain procedures were to be identified and disposed of, that cooperation could be made very much more lucrative, but only they were disposed of. Like a pig to the feeding trough, the head got to his face in the metaphorical dirt. Taking his money with a grin, the head agreed to a series of steps that essentially amounted to blowing up the finances of the base. The pieces would fall just where they needed at the feet of the investigators. Godara smiled. It was the easiest hunting he'd ever had, and Prey was offering its neck in friendship. Smile, you idiot. It's practice for the jail photo. But go through paperwork. The initial glance through the neatly countless gathered documents had already revealed a few notable discrepancies and oddities, enough to justify the raid of the team, but they had to go deeper. They needed to just justify the raid to the angry higher-ups who would not, no doubt, storm into their place of work and demand all their evidence. They needed to justify the raid to the very people they were targeting, who would no doubt try to squirm and t lie and weasel their way out even if they were captured and brought to trial. Every missing scent had to be documented. Every bullet shell out of the place had to be recorded. The more bureaucratic of the team members spent sleepless days and nights comparing mundane figures and seeking even the smallest discrepancy. The work was both boring and brutal, and to a normal man it could be well, well called torture. However, eventually, the documents had been picked apart to a lesson Adam that every man on the team had to consider himself impressed at what had been found. A stack of papers documenting all the potential discrepancies and peculiarities was nearly as tall as the original stack of paperwork that was being questioned. The baggy-eyed readers presented their work with pride. They had recorded all issues, the causes, possible explanations, and the debunking of these explanations, and everything else that one could possibly need. Good work, but shocking results, and draw on our friends. Tachi, what's the card player in his youth? 
Like most disillusioned youth entering the Japanese education system, he knew that the best games were with anonymous players, for no one could rig a round played with strangers. But the games where you wanted to win, you made sure half the board was in your pockets before the first card was dealt, and so Tachi prepared a very different board for the highest stakes game he ever played, and he knew he had to win. The players had met before, of course, in tracing the anomalies that led to the Navy branch in the first place, and there were psychological chunks in the armor he could use. Wounded pry was a potent substance, and Tachi manipulated it with surgical precision, saying without ever using words that the Yokusuka folks had simply not given the dues necessary to veterans such as themselves. A missed opportunity here, a broken deal there, surely it would add it up to. Then he offered, in deepest sincerity, a solution. If information were to pass hands, say regarding a certain period of transactions and of supply runs, and even what they knew of the branch's dealings itself, business was that was necessary but necessary could take place, and the obstacles to a deeper, more lucrative partnership could be removed. Well, Ko uh, Tai Chi united in lockstep, of course, and they took their bait, all of them. One even offered to use his own contacts to create incongruities and the branch of supply routes for the next month to demonstrate his own willingness. Tachi almost felt sorry for them, watching them drop their plans for their own demise. Almost. Well, our men are in. And as you can tell, this episode's been long. I don't. That's almost me live streaming without you guys even watching. Like, holy crap. This is a long episode. But we're in June, everybody. We are in June, and we're, we're pushing hard. Of course, some of the big threats. The meeting was tense, though. The branch representatives, well, had clearly dealt with corporate threats and foes before. However, he still did not suspect that the man was, he was meeting with was in so fact a corporate representative at all, but instead a member of the investigative team whose only goal was to take the whole branch down. Perhaps that showed that he was not as sly as he thought. The so-called corporate representative continued to drop big hints and subtle nods towards threatening ideas, unspecified enough to clearly non-binding but real enough to force the other end to cooperate. At first, the verbal spar was an even fight with each side prepared with smart and powerful arguments and half threats. However, as it went on, the undercover investigator clearly gained the upper hand. If skill is even, then he with a higher quality weapon shall prevail, and one side that much better weapons indeed. He dropped clues towards oddities and irregularities that had just so coincidentally been found where those irregularities might be reported to if things do not end well. He had the problems of funding high over the head of the foe, showing him that the things he could not afford to lose. Eventually, the other side crumbled and the deal was assured. The target was exposed, a genius negotiation, and a seducing of the promises. The best target is one that embraces you as you hold a knife over its back. The most effective way to erase a suspicion is through amity, and that is what has been offered. The investigation team had already organized a number of assets within the branch, and now that all needs to be done is to show them that the offer of cooperation truly is genuine, even if it is not. A group so clearly corrupt and greedy as this will respond best to the most classic and simple bribes, softly rustling bushels of yen bills. The first installation had been sent, promised to be one of many in a long and profitable relationship. Of course, this is a blatant lie, but a lie accompanied by cash is sweeter to the ear and harder to dispute. This influx of cash to the bank accounts will give the raid team the time needed to finalize and carry out all the planned disruptions into the supply chain. And with any luck, this unsuspecting targets will be too blinded by their bribes to suspect their new and generous benefactors. The carrot is a powerful motivator. Under the mercury lamps. Yu Jin rested on the cold stone bench, the wind blowing south through the garden in her arms. She cradled her grandchild, Selugi, nestled softly in a white blanket. Her legacy, the tree behind her rustled suddenly startling her, which started Selugi. On reflex, Yu Jin rocked her, cradling her to sleep. She remained fussy, her short arms reaching towards a blue sky. Soft, shushing, no reassurances that everything was alright would calm the child. As she cooed and called out to no one and everyone, Yujin wondered what Seoluji would be like when he got, she got older. Would she even see, reach adulthood? Yujin shook her head, admonishing herself, but there was far more immediate concern. What if her very own grandchild didn't understand Korean? What would happen then? She may be a baby now, but what about when she attends school? A song came into her head, a favorite of hers, and she began to sing to Seoluji. When the mercury lamp bloomed in the evening, Sujin's eyes swept the garden, bursting with bright flowers of white, red, and blue. She looked into Silugi's eyes, the brightest flowers of them all. On pacing this path, I used to walk alone with you. She cares Solgi's face, smiling down at her. The child smiled in return, showing off her growing teeth. Sujin kissed her forehead, touching her nose. The soft light of a mercury lamp does not change. The wind picked up as Eugene rocked Silugi harder. She yawned as Eugene talked her further into the blanket. And you don't seem to have it as well. She chuckled as Seolji's eyes drooped further and further. Aha! Under the light of a mercury lamp, Seolji fell asleep, her only movements breathing, being her breathing. Yujin rose from her bench, walking to the nursery, placing Seolji into a cradle. Yujin rocked it slowly. She walked away, turning off the lights and closed the door silently. Sweet dreams, child, sweet dreams. No independence today. Or whatever that was. They'll never see us coming. The investigation team had gathered yet again. Every member had bags under their eyes and looked weary from the weeks of work and reading. They were in the final stretches, they hoped. They knew their plan to, had to work. There was no other option. If it did not, then all their lives were over. They could go all to prison or far worse. They would win because they would not be able to live their live their lives if they lost. They went over the assets and planned again. They, one can never be too thorough with the stakes as high. The Navy demonstrated thoroughly that they 
that they think their newfound business partners are just that and only that. They have given no sign that they suspect anything, and for all intents and purposes, they could be treated as oblivious. Because they see it as just another company, even if they sense a threat, they can only imagine it is the same threat posed by any other company, which is, as I say, a small one that they can silence or deal with. Even if they get suspicious, they will not be remotely prepared for the attack headed their way. Most importantly, the paperwork is so dirty and ineptly kept that it reaches an almost comedic point. Even the relatively small amount of the team already has would be enough to send them spiraling into serious damage control. Once the raid is complete and the true extent revealed, they will never recover, and will likely cause a chain reaction. This could be the case of decades. Despite how nervous uh, the team is, this operation is honestly like shooting a fish in a barrel. The Navy stands no chance. We're so close. This fear is due. Cain had always many discussions with the Malagasy Republic's former leader. It was expected of him. Being a higher officer in the Japanese intervention army, the two men talked of war, battles, skirmishes, industry, weapons, and guns. Destruction was all Cain's world was, but even as he took like a liking to Gabriel, it almost brought Cain to bring to tears when he received the report. It had come to him deep in the night with a bright red marker reading classified plastered on the front of it. Gabriel had been assassinated by Japanese secret agents, but that was never going to be made public. Anywhere under the penalty of death, news broke quickly enough. The U.S. imperialists couldn't abide by the impress succeeding, establishing their own nation, so they made one final blow against the inf infant Malagasy Republic. Gabriel had one more use than a martyr, than a ruler, it seemed. It was almost too much for the cane to step back into what had been Gabriel's office. The room had been completely refurbished for the Didier. Oh, that's Akira. The new president of Madagascar electing, elected in the following discontent of the Gabriel's passing. He wanted to report on the most activities that he and Gabriel had in store until his untimely death, but Kane knew better than that. He was being tested. I told, I'm told that you and Gabriel had quite a little relationship over your months of spent together. Have no fear the operative used assassinated him has been put to justice. Did the uh, reluctant share a sly, s slim, s little slim spread across his face? Or smile. Kane gave Malagasy president his report as quickly as possible. It wouldn't do for Didier's first impression of Kane to be a soldier with a soft heart. He stepped into the army jeep, telling the driver to make for the army barracks, thinking to himself as the vehicle sped through the city. Madagascar was firmly implanted in this fear, and Gabriel's death would do nothing but reinforce this fact. Will the hypocrites have their due? Hmm. German sabotage effort, huh? Don't forget, don't forget. The afternoon sun shone through the windows of Jisoo's apartment, as fifteen children were strewn about, sitting on chairs, her couch, cushions on the floor. Now repeat after me, Jisoo put the pointer on the chalkboard. Seagulls don't cry over the sea. The children leaned closer to the board, trying to read and mimic her. Mimic her. A desk creaked as it moved closer to the front of the room. S Seagulls don't cry over the sea. The students squinted their eyes, clearly struggling to read. Jisoo stopped herself from yelling. These were just children who were learning. They will get it eventually. I hope you all study th this next week, because you're going to be reciting this to me one by one next week, she warned the students. An unintelligible cacophony of affirmatives erupted from the students as Jisoo returned to the chalkboard. The pointer swept across the second line of characters as Jisoo read it. Tears were wet in the bo water bottle in the Geogori, she read out. This time, her students read it nearly perfectly. Nodding, she moved on. A small boat on the far horizon. Oh, today you're not going. Today you're not done. Or you're not gone. The teacher pointed to a picture depicting exactly what she recited. A small boat on the far horizon. Oh, today you're not gone. The students repeated. Now, it's Rook. I'll be picking on students to read a part of the lyrics. Wun Hyung Ah, you go first. And so the students read the lyrics with Jisoo giving feedback in between. Still, gi ya, go a bit sober next time. As the last of the students left, Jisoo prayed, prayed for the success, but also they wouldn't forget where they came from. Korea, not Japan, and sure as heck are. Finally, the team went over the one final review. Oh my god, again and again. This is the actual last one before they moved on to the next stage, supposedly. It was a review of reviews of reviews, of course, and as everyone involved had been briefed countless times to ensure all data was factored in and all bases covered, everyone had to be reminded of a final time that no matter the consequences, what is being done here is right and just. The Navy refused to aid the investigation, and the only likely explanation is to save their own hides as a hammer comes down. More importantly than anything else, the Navy is clearly extremely guilty here, and any consequences they will face be, will be undeserved. The final preparation were at hand. The team began to transition and move forward. Despite all that had happened, only di then did the true gravity of the situation begin to sink in for many of those gathered. They were no longer helping Tachi and Kodera investigate just another murder. They were ripping the way of the curtain to expose the corrupt underbelly of a cheating, lying organization, no matter what was really there. They could well be changing Japanese history for the better or for worse. Onwards, we're not done yet. As we're going to have another review, probably, too. Because that's all we like to do here is read and within the first year and a half of Japan, like I complained last time when I played this, just a bunch of reading. Reading, reading, reading. Which we did have some Civil Wars, which is a nice a diversion and stuff, but like, my god, is it, it just, it just seems like it's too much. Team leader. Everything hinged on this raid. Subsequently, everything hinged on the leader. He wouldn't have a coward at the head of such a monumental event, an event that could change the course of Japan as a nation. He needed someone he could trust, someone who wasn't entangled in the conspiracy, a police officer would not do, that couldn't be trusted with a gun, let alone the most important raid in the history of the East. A soldier was not the one to get it done either. He just followed the orders of the state and killed some civilians along the way. It had to be a detective. Kodaira and Tachi jumped out. 
Tachi was aspirally na naive. Osaka transferred. Certainly quick with a handgun and quick with spirit, but he wasn't experienced with commanding groups and not a cynic like every officer in Tokyo. The boy was used to the small town Yakuza activities in Osaka and didn't have too much dirt on his hands, most importantly. He was a meticulously careful planner. Nothing will go on thought or unwritten, certainly a good choice. On the other hand, was Kodera, old, oh, broken, and cynical. The blood on his hands never dried, and his rage against corruption of the state, the corruption that killed so many, so many, never ceased. He was a loose cannon, but perhaps exactly what the raid needed was a loose cannon, hardened by the labyrinthian alleys of Tokyo. He didn't break a collapse under anything short of death, and he knew how to lead a team from years of practice. It was at risk taking in a man who had no reason to distress the state, but perhaps it was worth it, worth it in a time like this. I'll go with Tachi. I'm really supporting Tachi this time. Happy June. I could have done a little more of the focus right here, too, in the early planning stages, but... Oh, oh my god, we didn't read about... Why do we have to read about the equipment, too? I mean, I know, the Toolbox 3 update, that they made this less to read at the beginning, but my good god, is this way too much? We pray that the bull will not be used in this raid, ostensibly. It's an information-gathering mission. If a raid, a barely condoned secret plant, was to result in the death of an officer civilian, it would likely mean the end of any res resistance to the conspiracy that has gripped every level of the state. The corruption and the crimes as a result of this corruption would continue unfettered. While law enforcement sits by the wayside, therefore death is not an option. So we must bring weapons. If a soldier resists our raid, there is no option but to fire back, if not for our own self-defense. The argument remains as to what ha weapons to bring. Anything too strong will be both cumbersome and conspicuous. Something too small might mean that stopping power won't be able to punch through the plate armor or the soldiers. A few of the more police-minded traditional officers suggest simply bringing alone standard weapons from the army like riot shields, pistols, and sub small machine guns. These are readily available and officers are certainly familiar with them. However, they are not designed for use against military units with heavy armor, despite being used to control civilians and criminals. A few detectives and specialized officers suggest what they see is an obvious solution. Use military-grade equipment against military-grade troops. Semi-automatic rifles are also the Tokyo Armory for use against heavy, well-armed targets. The high caliber would cut through the armor used by soldiers like butter. A couple of these issues remain, but bureaucracy would have to be waded through to get these weapons. A bureaucracy drowning in corruption. Officers aren't training these weapons in the slightest. Heavy training will be required, and even with this, they won't be as skilled in comparison to earlier weapons. Bring out the fire rifles. Lighter weapons are familiar. We'll go with lighter weapons. I think we went with heavy weapons last time, which makes more sense, I think, but whatever. And the next reading as well. I know TNO is a, you know, basically a graphic novel set in the TNO universe, but like, Jesus Christ. At some point, you gotta ask yourself, how much reading is too much reading? How many events have we read? Lobster War ends. Oh, look at that. How much reading is too much? When it feels like we've had 50 in a single episode. Probably literally at least 50. That's your method. Plans lit to the floor of the complex. The occasional wind would send papers sprawling and staffers chasing vainly after them, but most important, the information had been taped down, written in scrawling notes, curling and dipping around the edges. A back door here, a hidden room there, an army just in the corner, and in the range of the alarm system's trigger, and a section of fence where the weeds grew just tall enough to disguise the necessary human-sized object in the foliage. The raid took shape, one action at a time, one maneuver after another. The soldiers were, using, were used for planning, Kodera and Tachi having both worked the men to physical exhaustion by putting them through the drills and pushing them to the end, or to the psychological brink in endless cycles of paperwork. Thankfully enough, only two of them were needed for the decision confronting them, and in all probability, just one of them could have done the job better. Would the raid use a frontal approach to military action, or would it attempt to infiltrate the area of inactivity and low surveillance? Auxiliary military police forces could handle themselves best in direct conflicts. Or situations, but and Kodira recommended a sharp, short entry into the compound. The schedule would be short, and the casualties would be limited. Tachi, on the other hand, advised that an indirect approach would allow for the minimalization of casualties and also allow for more accurate on the ground action. Both were a variable degrees suitable, but only one option could be taken. Give them, a, give them a warning. We want the jig to be up. Wait, what? Bust in? No, we, we went with light, light equipment, so we have to go with light equipment. Nice, not bad, not bad. Looking pretty good. Inflation's going up a little higher, but that's okay. A buzzing prelude. It was nighttime in the particularly quiet parts of Tokyo. The sun had set, and the cover of the night ruled over the rumbling city's buzzes and walls in dis the distance for once. Kodera and Tachi could find peace away from the trauma of such blasts of noise, but they were not spared from the baking heat and the dark dusk's darkness. A ride of temperatures had thickened the air, prickling their skin from under their sweaty white collars and trench coats. Kodera put took up off his cigarette. For singing it down by sighs, he gazed over the distant urban center they now overlooked from just outside the warehouse. He could not take his eyes away from the dazzling white lights that flickered so far away as if they were stars twinkling in the city he grew up in. He took another puff of cigarette and let out a deep breath. Kodara-san, surely it's not too hot for a cigarette now, even at this hour. Tachi chuckled after he broke through the glistening silence, but Kodira did not respond and said. He turned his head and out put out the smoke by stamping it into the ground. As law enforcement signaled that the raid in the search of the rogue IJN trail was about to commence, he reached for his handgun and held it by his side. Tachi, now with a smirk, firmly wiped from his face. His face. Follow the student uh, tailed the detective, the itching air pressed against their skin, growing hot as they approached the warehouse, and Kodera let out a groan of impatience before taking another breath, anticipating a great deal of trial to follow him into the gloomy complex. All's well that ends well, I hope, and hopefully not a ton more reading. At least for now, at least for this episode, because my god. 
The devs, I know this is supposed to be a major faction, major power, and we're supposed to have something like this, but Jesus Christ, it's insane. Um, numbers, numbers, numbers. The agent captain figured it out to the relief of his, young, of his younger aides. The map laid out before him detailed the situation. Red was on the back foot, having lost the ridge and the surrounding hill. Defense has already been established, and it was only a matter of time before Blue would achieve victory. Scribbles and thin arrows pinpointed potential weak spots, and thicker, as thicker arrows planned out. The finishing blows red just a little more, and they would win. Yet the captain was not met with silence, but instead with music. What the heck is going on? He asked no one in particular. The music being played was actually good, all things considered. The sound of the trumpet, the strong voice, and the fact it was upbeat all contributed to how good it was. Two battles interrupting his exercise. The captain turned the dial, controlling the frequencies. All were playing the same music. He heard a snicker from the right, as a voice saying, To the Japanese-born captain, the lyrics were unintelligible. To his aide, Taichu, the one who was calling the captain a fool. And what's the matter with you? The captain pointed to the aide, eyes narrowed. N nothing sir. The aide stiffened, though his face betrayed him. The captain simply glared at him, gruffly telling the group to call off the exercise. The aides cleared out of the tent, and Taichu relieved that he was going out of the captain's sight. It began humming the tune that had ruined the exercise. Bobbing his head to the chorus, You are a fool, you are a fool, he imagined, addressing the captain in private, finally airing his grievances. You are a fool, you are a fool, the song in his head continued. You are a cold man who does not know my mind. The tense crux. Godair and Tachi entered the building, guns raised, and were greeted by nothing but deathly silence. Flickering bulbs swung overhead, casting dim lighting under the concrete floor. Tail, uh, tall walls of stacked crates filled the warehouse, and soon the patter of rain on the roof filled in silence with complex had offered them. Find anything? Got nothing on my side, Radio Kodair to Tachi. Uh, the soft static reverberating off the walls. No, I haven't found anything yet either, replied Tachi, shining his flashlight on a desk he stumbled upon, finding nothing but some pen and paper. Darn it, remarked Kodaira. This guy's really cleared everything out. Dudes must have taken it all left, he said, pursuing through the filing cabinets without success. Wait, where, Tachi, come here? I found something. Kodaira and Tachi now were staring at a rusty metal door, its window blocked by wooden planks. Kodaira found its knob and willing to budge. Let me handle this, stated Tachi. A simple kick sent the door flying sideways. Funneling in, the team found themselves in a dark alleyway, or hallway. Its air moisty and the floor riddled down with puddles as its stench was foul like rotting waste, then a noise like rats scampering. Something wasn't right. Something definitely wasn't right. Quiet. They're here. Okay, still only July. And another event. For this three hour episode, Sans choose the Vigilant. The prickle of anticipation shuddered down Kodera's spine. He was begrudgingly certain that where the small chattering scratch came from was exactly what they'd been looking for. He took a deep breath and reached through the back pocket for another cigarette to ease his blistering mental tension. A dark and creaking corridor the team had stuffed themselves into had an air thick with fear choking out every breath. Tachi made eyes with contact with uh, Kodera from behind a group of law enforcement officers. His eyes were jittery and dashing across the room in, intense, in, in intense dread. Kodera, Kodera, Kodera. Clenches jaw and pressed his feet into the ground to conceal his own anxieties from his colleagues in the room adjacent to theirs. A small flicker of a flame and low levels of mumber muttering could be heard by the entirely attentive team. Whilst law enforcement listened in, Kodira, Kodira rested his eyelids and braced himself for the inevitable violence to come. Tai Chi looked over to him for affirmation, who stood by the shattered window and the peeling wallpaper before nodding with pursued lips, or pursed lips, and a sweaty brow. Their lack of words was unsettling, but their body language spoke volumes of the foreboding ready to come. Now the count of three, the agents broke down the door and wailed, uh, rest or... Order arrests, arrest orders, to the naval officers, incriminated in the month-long investigations, innumerable hours of research, scouring and chasing dead leads that led the team to this very moment. Kodiara let out another deep sigh before he too charged in the dank retreat. Brace yourselves as the shootout will begin. In the name of love. For Zhang Ziki, nothing could be better than sitting in a record store and listening to the merchandise as the city of Nanjing ambled on outside of her window. All the likes of businessmen, salarymen, and people just looking to get by, pass by her window. A growing pile of poems of the best prose she could muster all stood tall on her desk, ready to collapse as the smallest breast touched it. Zeke Key was hunched over her desk, calculating how many sales she would have to make her cover rent. Deep in thought, her train of thought was broken by the ringing of the chimes, a paper tower collapsed. Too slow to react, Zeke watched as a customer tried to save her stack of papers for her only to fall to the floor. Looking up, she realized that a Japanese officer had just walked into the store. P -p Pace fell, she shot up. Do you need any help, sir? She cringed at her Japanese. I'm so sorry for causing the mess. Do you need any help? The officer seemed genuinely apologetic and embarrassed. Zeke nodded. In a few mo seconds, the stack had been reassembled, then divided into chunks to avoid an incident. Do you have Devin so trot? The officer asked anxiously. Zeke walked over to a rack filled with the record covers. There should be some Li Ma Jia here, she pointed to another rack. There are Kim He Jia and Shui Shuk Suk Jia. The officer nodded, searching through the mass of covers. From the corner of her eyes, Ziki could see him pick out a few records as she picked out ten. She left the records on her desk, telling him to let him let her know when he was done. It came over a few seconds later, holding a bunch of records in his arms. Is there any way you can package this? He asked. I'll pay extra. Ziki nodded, producing a box from under her desk. She placed the records in the box. That would be 500 yen. She got 550. As the man left, Ziki stopped him. Why did you buy trot records anyways? Aren't they illegal? The officer raised an eyebrow, seemingly acknowledging her argument, and then smiled fondly. They're for my wife. 
and give it a few more days, and then another event's going to appear very, very soon. In the nick of time. And the blurred moments, Kodiara could make out uh, after law enforcement had charged in the officers implicated after the crimes had been subdued and constrained on the floor and against the walls of the decrepit hideout. He lowered his handgun as an intense brush uh, of relief washed over him, followed by the unbinding of pressure that had coiled around his old heart. The putrid smell of soft, molded over wallpaper and furniture had swamped the room in a disgusting stench, but at least the criminals had been arrested. Kodiara thought to himself, he coughed up a brief chuckle. As he walked through the room until his eyes passed over the two dead officers shot by law enforcement and the resistance to the arrest, their lifeless eyes had rolled back, leaving a glossy white hue that reflected the dim and flickering flame from the makeshift incinerator a few steps away. Kodiara scoffed, signaling for some help and clearing up the mess. Tai Chi scrambled past the raiding team and appeared down the rusted barrel housing the flame. It already burned many of the documents that the naval officers wanted to get rid of. Tai Chi choked on his breath. Excuse me, sir, I think they were trying to cover their tracks before they knew that we'd get here, before stepping over to flick the preserved fly files left untouched. Kodiara chuckled to himself, turning his eyes back to the subdued officers with a wise and dismissive glare. We've got you now, you sly dudes. We have everything we need to have you locked up forever or worse. All in a day's work. Trying on the toko. A black dish shines in the fluorescent light as the photo photographs needle cards its thousandth valley. Through the speaker, soft music imported from Manchukuo played, filling the room with the sips of women, or sounds of women, singing to the classical music. Officer Nakayama Sho sips his tea, skimming through the incident report. Sitting down his tea, he takes out a fountain pen, signing off on the breakup of a Marxist ring. Dropping the file into the finished pile, he opens the window, letting the cool breeze flow into the office. The doorknob sounds out, and Shuo turns his head. A secretary sticks her head through the door. May I come in? She holds out what seems to be a file. Probably another report. At Shuo's nodding, she promptly drops the file on the last clear spot in his desk. A tiny thud sounded out, and he sat down to look through it. Reading through the documents, his eyebrows raised. Truncated for re brevity. In recent months, illegal music has been exploded in popularity across Korea and the home islands. According to the related reports, the propagation of such music has been driven by the NAJUA. Thus, efforts must be focused on suppressive subversive media wherever possible. The memo must have been passed through the darn place, Sho thought. Squeezing his eyes as he looked at the record player, he thought to himself out loud, It's going to be a crap show. A Lucian Wilderness Report one of Sasakawa's associates' more adventurous ventures is the Sakura Wilderness Resort in the Lushin Islands, formerly a backwater in one of the most far-flung regions of J the Japanese Empire. The Lushin Islands has become a sort of a mini-business haven for those who could make it in Tokyo. Prior to the establishment of the Sakura Resort, the Lushin Islands was a seedy underbelly, ironic given its sparsity and distance from Japan. American and Canadian contraband goods flowed through the tiny ports of Atu and Kiska from lucky strikes to Playboy magazines. Of course, this wasn't until the IJN area commander was replaced after crossing some higher ups. Since then, the crime infested underbelly turned into a haven for Japan's thrill seeking under one of Sasakawa's many affiliates. From extreme hiking to snowboarding and winter fishing in the frigid north, of note, many of the former criminals and contraband smugglers still eke out their livings there, just under a new shiny uniform and the veneer of an actual company. Sasakawa himself has managed to distance himself sufficiently from this project, though anyone who's anybody in Japan knows that there's more to the resort's profit than salmon, hunting, raid, tabloid-friendly, adrenaline rush adventure. In spite of it all, Sasakawa has stayed clean, no traces of the resort's profit is tangibly dirty money, though just one has to ask for the special menu at the Izakaya between 2am to 5am every Wednesday, and one will discover that not much has changed since. A trip to the wilderness, trotting across the ocean. Choi Sang-gu sat back in his chair, putting the next record into the player. As he did so, he spoke into the receiver in Korea. You are listening to uh, Radio S Seoul, and I'm Choi Sang-gu. The time is 7 o'clock, and coming up is a song from Kim Young im He let the needle go as the upbeat flutes and the faint back backing vocals gave away to the queen of the trot herself. For someone who had been living in her entire life under Japanese rule, her Korean was nearly free of Japanese. Though he shouldn't really be complaining. He was born in America, after all. A knock on the door startled Sang-gu. His legs hit the desk, shaking the equipment. Sorry about that, sang sang si Someone from the government came earlier and they gave this to me. Su Yong held up a manila folder stuffed with papers. Continuing, I read everything. You will want this. She dropped it off in Sengu's lap as he played the next song. Skimming over his contents, he smirked. That was something he could do. A week later, the PA systems of the Japanese legations came alive. The songs of Toyota Nadeshiko and Mitsugi Nori played. Confusion. Then amusement turned to terror as all the military frequencies were flooded with music. Nothing could come in from the locations, and nothing could come out. For Tokyo, this was a disaster. For Washington, Sungu, and Radio Seoul, the operation could not have been more of a success. So versus everywhere. A clean and quick affair. The dust had settled. The guard accounted for, the debriefings finished, it had been almost too easy to see the, seize the things they needed. Information, executive management, and a wide-reaching warrant for further investigation of the armed forces for suspected treason. Illegal trafficking and conspiracy against the emperor, an uneasy peace reigned in the room, in the meeting room, and Kodera and Tachi used this peace to plan their next move. She began by thinking, thanking the many people who had made this investigation possible, and Kodera, stuffy as ever, bowed formally and in gratitude, and bears by laughter rippled in the space of the hall. 
Moving to a serious note, the two warned the team that the information that they currently had indicated possible breaches of trust going all the way to the upper echelons of the sphere, and that the government itself was too deeply implicit. This meant that keeping the investigation internal would be suicide, both professionally and possibly physically. But how would this investigation be kept from going without legal lethal consequences? Tachi introduced the plan to keep the armed forces accountable in the public eye, a four-hour conference with the press of Japan, so wide-scale and exhaustive in detail that it would be irrefutable. Only with the truth could the investigation and their own lives be safeguarded. Quadera ended on a cryptic note, warning them to keep this to themselves. No one knew what was going to happen to the Kokusai when this was finished, but it was unlikely to be pleasant. And as for themselves, quite, quite ominous. Now I'll get to a few more, maybe a few more readings, and then we're going to end the episode because it's gone on long enough. Holy crap. I spent way too long reading all this stuff, as Russia is now literally starting to kill itself. But tie up loose ends. The investigation team's complex of meeting rooms, drawing boards, and hallways was a complete mess. Here and there, there were scribbles and messy diagrams implicating almost every figure in the imperial government in one way or another. And the paperwork had seemed to come alive in the months since the initial murder. It turned merrily, tumbled merrily down desks and out of cabinets, splayed across the rooms without any real sense of order. And the folders marked with the cause for concern or needs urgent attention were many and fewer resolved. It was all utterly unacceptable, and more importantly, potentially damaging to the press release. Koder and Tachi decided to refocus their efforts on taking care of these loose ends to prevent any damaging information from leaking out and hurting their credibility. Given that what half the papers in Japan were saying, their credibility was already in mortal peril, no further assistance was needed on that score. Three main areas of, were identified for attention. The, money, the mountains of paperwork involved in the investigation had to be settled. The accounting of financial flows between the Army and Navy, at least those that could be tracked, finished with the help of external organizations and the captives from the armed forces interrogated to reveal their dealings. The rest would be minor in comparison. Kodera and Tachi nodded, scribbling notes in the books, and began to reorganize the complex. Even if the outside world was meeting, they could restore order here and perhaps even ensure their survival would be on that of the immediate future. Wow, look at the paperwork I just found! And selling accounts, like... I don't know what the devs did, but like they just they went insane with all the reading here. The counting of the armed forces has been limited by two factors, time and exhaustion. The time had suffered from crippling so shortages of one and overabundance of the latter, and so examination had been brief and cursory, limited to the single biggest source of revenue they could track down. Even the details then had been brief and limited to strictly functional. Bare bones examination worked well with presenting a bunch of confused military bureaucrats with evidence that they weren't prepared to handle, but it wouldn't fly in the eyes of the press. Drastic improvements would have to be made by the time of the press release, and that day was drawing ever closer. The team pulled their leads from the, some of their minor accounting firms they had prior experience with and began work. It turned out that the money circulating around the sphere, though, through this branch with other armed forces had been crafted by a few hands. More promisingly, it appeared to circulate around a few key agencies and departments rather than an endless mess of laundering through the many departments of the sphere. Even so, there was much to be done, and the simple task was not necessarily a straightforward one. During the briefing, one member of the team voiced his concerns over the sheer amount of documentary evidence flowing through the complex. Boxes and boxes and files and documents, all of which could be compromised. Cordero's face turned black as he left the room while Tao Chi's Boys of trademark assurances that security was tight as ever, but the truth was that no one truly knew how to safeguard this volume of information, and the town was drawing close when those they, they would have to wield it. Crunch the numbers and we can worry about security later. Who cares about security? I'm worried about the economy. Interrogate the captives. The room was small and closed and padded just enough for the voices to sound off the walls. Standard police engineering, uh, and who could forget the classic table and dim a dimly lit lamp? Every cadet was taught that interrogation lay not in words but in atmosphere, and this atmosphere had been delicately crafted. The target had information uh, <clears throat> that could save or doom the government of Japan. Cordera looked through the case files. Everything seemed to be in order. Most of the captains they had arrested through the raid had been career bureaucrats, fattened off the government money. A cozy life in the military with limited training in combat would make easy targets. A few days in confinement and a silken glove approach would secure them just as much as any Yakuza lowlife. Not that the Yakuza ever visited the police. He then leafed through a well-worn copy of the list of key performance indicators that the team outlined. The usual requests were all there. Money, transactions, agencies, names, and personnel... Personal... Involvement. All informative, all useful, all critically incriminating. And remember, the targets were reminded that they served no purpose except to as hostages for the Army Navy, which was true, but only to an extent. They might prove more willing to negotiate after all. The easiest way to surrender was through false accomplice. Uh, uh, fate accomplice. The target entered the room, held on either side by guards. Caldera brought up the most wolfish smile and began to speak. So, my friend, do you know why you're here? Look at that, 96.1%. Oh my goodness, 3.5%. Not bad. Clear the paperwork. After many, many hours of hard work and reading, the papers justifying the investigation and the raid had finally been sorted and categorized. Huge stacks of papers have been moved, no longer lining every wall but instead properly organized and stored. While that many finally have been completed, the security of the papers still remain in question, and many within the department worried that by centralizing and categorizing the papers, they had in fact just made it easier for the foes to seize the evidence and at so many and so many months of work. However, there was a rumor that Tachi and Kodaira had a plan. Word around the department was that the two detectives, having foreseen the inevitable attempt by enemies to steal the papers, had organized for the documents to be moved and stored in a secure location. However, the two refused to confirm the one question. Everyone on the investigation team had hoped that they did have need of a plan because if the papers were lost and all the work would have just been for nothing, or even caused for more harm than justice. They'd better have a plan. The footsteps of giants. 
The investigation team gathered once more, called by Tachi and Kodera. The looks on the faces of the two detectives were grave. They wasted no time as soon as the team was gathered and got right to the business. They informed the team that despite their hopes, it seemed that there would be many foes yet to come in their fight for justice. No longer were there just a Navy and Army involved, and now it seemed possible that those implicated could run all the way up to the Eno clique itself. The Audit Bureau and the Central Command itself could try to get involved along with the Army and Navy Ministry. Kodera said heavily before continuing. He gave an apology for dragging the entire team into danger and expressed sincere regret that this could not have ended as simply as another murder case. However, there's no distinct possibility that the job securing even the lives of everyone on the team was now in serious danger. Because of this, the two primary actions had to be taken. Firstly, security had to be tightened severely. Contact outside of clubs, trusted friends, and family was to be reported and set, kept to a minimum. Secondly, a group life insurance policy was taken out on the team in case any of them did end up losing their lives for justice. Though everyone on the team felt somber, they knew that these measures were necessary. They just wished they weren't. We can only pray. But I think I'm going to end the episode there just because it's gone on way too long. And there's just... I'm never going to play Japan again. I don't think I'll ever play Japan again, maybe. Or maybe I'll play again, but I'll never read anything, everything again because, my God, it's it's too much. But let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. If you made it this far, please do consider leaving a like. I do appreciate you guys coming around and watching. But leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow where we'll hopefully not have to read so much. Thanks for watching, though. Have a great rest of your day.